Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's council meeting. Council acknowledge that the Wadawurrung people is the traditional owners of the land, waterways and skies, and we pay our respects to the elders past and present. We acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are part of our Greater Geelong community today. This meeting is being broadcast on the internet and the recording of the meeting will be published on the council's website. The lights change. Uh, my name is Peter Murray. I'm the Mayor. I'll be chairing this meeting tonight. Welcome everyone in the chamber and hello to the community members streaming online. On behalf of Council, I want to send our thanks to all of Greater Geelong's emergency response and community support workers for their tireless efforts in dealing with the impacts of multiple flood events over the past couple of weeks. There's been significant impacts on our roads, facilities, buildings, and of course, our residents. Your collective service shows the strength of our community and Council is very grateful for your time, dedication, and expertise. If forecasts of further heavy rain in the coming weeks come true, then our community will be calling on you again. So please take any opportunity you can to rest and look after yourself. Uh, before we get underway, I'm pleased to announce that next month's meeting on Tuesday the 22nd of November will again be out in the wider community. The meeting will be held at the Eastern Hub Community Centre on MacKillop Street in East Geelong. You'll find more details about that meeting at Geelong Australia website and the team will promote it more as we get closer to the date. And as a shout out to anyone celebrating their birthday today. So we have questions to come in from members of the community, so let's get started. I ask uh, that Councillor Contell and Councillor Mansfield be noted as apology for tonight's meeting. Councillor Contell has previously been granted a leave of absence. Uh, there's no other apologies for tonight's meeting to note. Uh, so Leave of absence. Councillor Harwood is seeking a leave of absence to be granted from the 16th of November to the 28th of November, inclusive. Do I have a mover and a seconder for that, please? <laughs> Move Councillor Aiken, seconded Councillor Sullivan. All in favour? Thank you, that is carried. Councillor Mansfield is seeking a leave of absence to be granted from the 10th of November to the 12th of December, inclusive. Do I have a mover and a seconder for that? Move Councillor Harwood, seconded Councillor no, uh, Mason, all those in favour? That is granted. Thank you. Are there any other leaves of absence to note this, this evening, councillors? No. Are there any declarations of conflict of interest in relation to, not, to tonight's agenda? No. If any conflicts arise during the meeting, please make them known. So the confirmation of the minutes. Can I please have a mover and a seconder to confirm the minutes of the council meeting held on the 27th of September? Move Councillor Harwood, seconded Councillor Grisbeck. All in favour? That is carried. And could I please have a mover and a seconder to confirm the minutes of the special council meeting held on the 12th of October? Councillor Asher moved and seconded Councillor Mason. All those in favour? That is carried. Thank you, councillors. Public question and submission time. The next agenda item is public question and submission time. It is specifically available for questions and submissions rather than as a forum for discussion. Uh, in accordance with our policy, we set aside 45 minutes for question time, providing for each person to address the council for three minutes per question or submission, with a maximum of two questions per person. Questions and submissions provided in writing prior to the meeting will be considered first. After this, if time permits, members of the gallery will be given an opportunity to ask a question or make a submission. However, if it's in relation to an agenda item, councillors won't be able to provide you with an answer, but you'll be able to hear us consider the item shortly. I note there are some questions relating to items on tonight's agenda, which are directed at councillors. These include item 2.2, the Heighton Village Urban Design Framework, and item 2.3, Bluestone Cottage Relocations Feasibility Study. As these items are being considered tonight, councillors will be unable to answer any questions during public question time. For those who have pre-submitted questions but are not present tonight, responses to your questions have been published on the council's website and will also be emailed to you. 
it's also important to note that each councillor has read the questions sent in. Tonight's meeting, we have received pre-submitted questions from 24 community members. Those individuals and their topics of interest are Kevin Craston's uh, the grand final celebrations and support for the Campisi Shire flood. Uh, Mary Ramia, tree removal, South Geelong Rail Corridor. Graham Hobbs, heightened UDF. Matt Goulter, heightened UDF. Matthew Portbury, heightened UDF. Jack McFarlane, tree removal, South Geelong Rail Corridor. Erin Heer, heightened UDF. Uh, Katrina Izdebeski, urban forest strategy. Bill Marshall, urban forest strategy. Tina Smallman, heightened UDF. Sally Kerner, Packingdon Street UDF. Andrew Kados, Heighton UDF. Jennifer Banto, Marshall, Bluestone Cottage. Angela Mangan, Packingdon UDF. Uh, Caitlin Kirby, Packingdon UDF. Valued Eagles, Heighton UDF. David Spears, Heighton UDF. Jessica Sullivan, uh, Packingdon Street UDF. Simon Nardi, Heighton UDF. Prue Beck, Heighton UDF. Paddy Siler, Packington UDF. Brendan John Quirk, Packington UDF. Catherine Talbot, uh, Dean Street. And Dr Jane Mooney, Packington UDF. Um, I have a show of hands of those in the gallery whose name I've just read out. So we will start. with Kevin Crastons. Is Kevin here? Thanks, Kevin. <coughs> Senator Kevin. As you know, Mr Mayor, the Geelong Cats won the AFL Premiership this year, which was fantastic for the club and, and for the town. Um, first, I just wish to congratulate councillors who were actively supporting the Geelong Cats live site, which was held at the St Mary's Oval. Uh, in particular, I'm looking at the councils, Nelson, Harwood, Mason, I don't know all the councils, but um, certainly probably Trent, there's Eddie, um, certainly Councillor Aiken there, Kylie, um, well done, I congratulate you all for putting it up. Um, and really the question is to make sure that we've got a framework for future grand finals should the council, certain, not sorry the council, should the cats participate in the, the grand final. Certainly the live site worked well but also the Sunday um, activity to see so many parents there with young kids and families participating and probably in the tens of thousands there at St Mary's Oval. So well done councillors and thank you. Can I just quickly respond to that? I think we've actually all learnt lessons from it. Um, some councillors um, don't barrack for Geelong, like the Mayor, so he probably doesn't believe Geelong's ever going to win another Premiership again. In fact, it's going to be a Collingwood dynasty for the next 10 years. However, some of us are actually much more realistic about um, Geelong's chances in the next couple of years again. We have learnt um, lessons, both the football club as well too. The community does want fan sites and live sites. And um, I think um, we will um, all work better together in the future to ensure that um, there's some mandatory things that need to be planned well yeah. ahead, um, and that's one of them is a fan site, yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Did you have another question? Oh, the second question yep. related to the, um, our rural neighbours up in Campaspe and I suppose what I saw in the media on Sunday where I saw yourself and Deputy Mayor getting off the spirit of Tasmania and then um, the Mayor of Campaspe being grilled, I think unfairly, by the media where they're going through some really difficult times and I just felt that perhaps we at Geelong could reach out and just um, whatever way we can help support, even a phone call to say that we're thinking about them. Um, in these really difficult times. I know, as you said at the start of the meeting, that there's flood issues here in Geelong, and there are, but I think for our rural you know, councils, we should, in, in this state, we should be helped supporting them, whether it's bags or whether it's just a phone call. That's all it really was, uh, Mr Mayor, so thank you for taking that question. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. 
Robin, did you just want to respond to that, the last Yes, yeah, thanks, Kevin, for your question. Um, and your, your suggestion about reaching out to the Shire of Campaspe with a message of support. And as the, the Mayor has already acknowledged, there's flooding occurring in lots of places. And we acknowledge the impact of the flooding emergency on the many communities, including Campaspe, right across Victoria. It certainly is um, a, a significant crisis. Uh, in terms of support, in December of 2020, the Municipal Association of Victoria invited councils to sign up to the uh, municipal MAV, Emergency Management Sharing Protocol. The City of Greater Geelong is one of 69 councils which has signed on to the sharing protocol. The protocol sets out an agreed position between councils regarding the provision of resources and support to other municipalities with response and recovery tasks during and after emergencies, such as the one we're experiencing now. So the city will contribute to the sharing protocol as required, um, should that be activated. So thanks, Kevin, for your question tonight. Thank you, Robin. And just before you go, Kevin, uh, Councillor Grisby. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I sit on the MAV board as well, um, and we have reached out as a board because uh, we look after 79 councils across Victoria, and each, nearly every single council is affected by some kind of uh, flooding effect. So we have reached out and, and offered uh, the, the Municipal the Association of Victoria's assistance as well. So there is assistance there um, when they need it, because it's not just now, it's probably in five weeks' yeah. time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Council Colin. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you, councillors, and keep up the good work. Amira Ramia. Are you there, Mary? How are you? Hi, thank you. A little bit nervous. <laughs> um, so, um, councillors, um, I would like to know if the current council-owned land will remain with the council or given to VicTrac after the, um, the works are completed. Do you want to just ask each question, Mary, and we'll get um, a response to Oh, okay. Ask all of them? Yep. Okay, all right. Um, if the trees have to be removed, what is the plan for remediation after the works are completed, and when will we see the plans in writing? And the last question um, is, why was the community kept in the dark on the extent of the tree removal along this part of Geelong, and was it done deliberately to avoid the community being upset and protesting. Questions, Mary. I'll uh, we'll go to Guy Wilson Brown, Director of uh, <laughs> City <laughs> Services. Thank you, uh, Mary, uh, for your questions. Uh, and I'd just guess like to say, uh, as background, I guess for everyone here tonight, that the rail duplication project is a state-owned and run project. Uh, and all approvals are done under the Major Transport Facilitation Act. So council is in a position of advocating uh, on behalf of the concerns of residents. So Mary, we thank you for bringing uh, these uh, issues to our attention. With respect to question one, uh, the city-owned land uh, will return uh, to the council after the project is complete. Uh, question two. RPV has assured us it understands that mature trees are a very important feature of the area around South Geelong and that every effort has been made and will be made to preserve as many trees as possible. RPV is working closely with the city, also Barm Water, V-Line and Vic Track on replanting and landscaping plans for the area and the city will continue to advocate for the best outcome for the community regarding tree removal and replacement. RPV also advises that they'll be replanting more trees than what is required to be removed and will work with the city to identify other locations for additional trees. And in specific response to your question about the plans, RPV have, rep have said they will share landscaping plans uh, with council and the community uh, in the near future. Question three. RPV has advised that it has undertaken community consultation during the planning and design of the project over the past 12 months, as well as notifying the South Geelong community about upcoming works and vegetation removal in their area. However, we do acknowledge that that hasn't happened in all instances, such as yourself, Mary. Uh, during August and September, door knocks, community information sessions, one-on-one -on -one meetings occurred with residents across South Geelong and Breakwater to support the release of updated designs for South Geelong Station 
and Fine Street level crossing removal to discuss construction impacts, including tree removal with residents and the community. RPV will continue to inform residents about upcoming tree and vegetation removal occurring in November and December. RPV is door knocking residents in areas where tree removal is occurring and encourage anyone who wants further information to get in touch with the RPV project team. RPV will continue the process of consulting the community on urban design, landscaping and creative opportunities for the project with more detailed information about revegetation and landscaping plans to be shared with the community over the coming months. Uh, and I guess as a final note, we do acknowledge that that information I've read out has been provided by RPV. Uh, we do acknowledge that it's not being done as well as we would like, and we've had several meetings with RPV already, and we're meeting with them on a weekly basis to make sure that the situation improves, uh, including we're going to be personally reviewing all the uh, landscape plans and tree removal plans as well. So thank you, Mr. Met. Thank you, Thanks, Mary. Thank, thank you. you. Graham Hobbs. Good evening, Mayor and Councillors. Thank you for the opportunity. I have three questions, but I'll just answer and re refer to two. Before I do that, I have a further um, 306 signatures of the petition which I lodged at Lara last meeting. So if that could be added to the other ones. I look at you as our representatives and I ask you to take action. I recommend that the councillors act on the overwhelming current wishes in excess of 4,708 signatures, users, not the drug users, but the clients, residents, ratepayers and the heightened business proprietors and traders as expressed in the petition. And the historical paper, and I've got the Geelong News of 1996 in relation to the clock tower over there, uh, which I also presented last time. Um, uh, I invite the various departments and organisations who are behind you in relation to the, this six year saga to act and amend substantially, say 90%, dismiss it, for the proposals for the unique and very functional Heighton village. Say so for the footpaths, the services, the signage and upgrades to the Bellevue Arcade. I also ask you to consider only two stories in relation to any proposed developments. Um, I look at the roundabout. We call it a roundabout, everybody does. But it's a traffic management facility. I ask, where is the evidence that the functional traffic management system at the intersection of Taylor Court and the clock tower is unworkable and unsafe? As I, having had a practice, legal practice, in 1978 until 2011, heightened, the only sole legal practitioner, I did not receive one personal injuries or property damage case in relation to traffic proceeding through that intersection. I rest my case a, a fraction. I'll just go on a little fraction further. Um, if you use the intersection, and I hope most of you have, you get a very clear view from proceeding uh, from series into the intersection. There is also a very good arrow coming from uh, the river and you can see what transpires there. The, the other aspect which I'd like to mention is in relation to the slip road. The slip road proposal is dangerous. I say this because they're going to put a number of trees along the slip yard. They're going to take away 13 car parks and they're going to funnel tra traffic into Barable Road right at the corner where the sign is and uh, that is I believe a disaster waiting to happen. So I ask you to consider the petition and also the large number of people here which have come to support the petition. Thank you,
Matt Golter. Uh, I'm not sure there's even a question asked there, Gareth. It was more of submission. Did you re need a response for that, Graham? Uh, yes, if you can, there's a public could come here. Yep, Gareth Smith, City Planning and Economy. Thanks, Gareth. Thanks, Graham. I appreciate you coming along again this evening and asking the questions and your submissions. I, I do know it did vary a bit from what was submitted online, uh, but still happy to obviously oblige and, and respond to you. Uh, and clearly, I know some of those questions are councillors, but as the Mayor introduced at the start, obviously the councillors can't comment on that while they're deliberating on that tonight. So you appreciate where they, um, I'll, I'll provide a response. Um, Can I just have some quiet in the do. chamber, please? Thank you. So, so I, I picked up there were three elements that you, I feel you wish to have some comments on. And one of those was around the evidence around the roundabout and proposed changes for that area. There's three independent traffic engineering reports that actually recognise it doesn't comply with Australian standards. Officers are obliged then therefore to actually make recommendations around designs that actually do comply with Australian standards. So that's the driver of actually why that was proposed. You made a comment around the slip road uh, proposal and the trees. All these proposals set out as a vision and actually then there's detailed design work if and when council funds those sort of projects to work in consultation with community and traders. And through those processes you actually work out obviously tree alignment and other things like that to ensure safety and good visibility at those things. You know, it's a standard process. And the other comment you made on was with the car park losses in that area, but certainly the UDF does pick up where there'll be no net losses. It actually identifies other opportunities where you can pick up car parking as well, where some are removed to replace those as well. So the aim is that there is no net loss on car parks. I think those are the three key points that you raised. So hopefully that provides some information to assist. That does. Um, just the car parking, you mentioned it. There's going to be 37 car parks removed with the proposals at Nardi and also the Slip Road and the two at Taylor Court. That's uh, from the, on the plans that you've got there. And I don't think that's good for the, our community. Thank you. Thank you. Matt Bolter. Matthew Portbury. Alan. Um, are the councillors aware that for no good reason Rail Projects Victoria intends felling street trees along Carr and Strong Street South Geelong, including a Banksia marginata on Strong Street, which is a nesting site for a pair of New Holland honey eaters? Thanks, Mary. Uh, Guy? Again, uh, Mary, on behalf of uh, Jeff, uh, yes, councillors uh, are aware, um, and the city has raised well Jeff's concerns and yours uh, regarding tree removal with RPV, and we acknowledge that this extent of tree removal is concerning for both the community and council officers and councillors. Um, however, we also acknowledge that this is an important project for the region uh, that will deliver more frequent and reliable services and improved uh, patronage for, for passengers and in the growth areas of South Geelong. RIPV have also informed us that further trees and vegetation will need to be removed in or near the rail corridor because they are directly in the path of where new infrastructure will be located or close to works where tree root structure will be damaged to the extent that it causes a safety risk. RPV have also advised us that qualified wildlife ecologists are on site to inspect all trees and vegetation prior to removal and that handlers safely relocate any wildlife to suitable habitat nearby. Thank you again, Mary, for your question. Thank you. Erin uh, here. Yeah. Um, I just would like to know how the City of Greater Geelong can justify the expense, which is going to be thousands and thousands of dollars, if not millions, to drastically change height and village when the overwhelming community feedback is opposed to the Council's UDF. We have over 4,700 signatures on a petition that supports pavement upgrades and signage improvements and the upgrade of the village walk but the community is strongly opposed to the disruption of traffic flow 
and super tall three to four storey buildings. How can this feedback not be taken on board? Why not limit it, the development, to two storeys? And I blended both my questions. And the library has been given a five-year protection because you say you've listened to the community, but five years is not really protection. Darren, um, Gareth. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Erin, for the questions. Um, with regard to the first one, I, I picked up there was a couple of elements around that. One was traffic flow, and the other was the height of proposed buildings. So, um, but, and also around funding. So at the moment, all the city is funded, or the council have funded, is for the refurbishment of Bellevue Arcade and Village Walk. And that was approved by council in last financial year. So that's the current... Voting on the yeah, media. no, I, I come to that as well. Yeah. So all other works are subject to future budget, budgets or other government grants as well. Regarding traffic flow, a proposed changes to flow of traffic throughout the village have been based on the recommendation of three independent traffic reports, as I referred before, which I've, it, I've identified a range of safety issues and non-compliance with Australian standards. Several traffic flow arrangements were independently tested by those consultants who proposed a layout that encourages slower vehicle speed, pedestrian and vehicle safety, ease of movement for both pedestrians and vehicles and has limited impact on travel times for all road users and improves the public realm and amenity. What that refers to, it actually looks at areas where you can expand that footpath arrangements for future alfresco and those sorts of things. So with the three, four, three, to, three to four storey buildings, the proposed three storey building heights are limited, uh, are less than what is possible under the current planning controls for the heightened village. They are marginally higher than the current tallest building at Bellevue Avenue at nine metres. The proposed controls include a two-storey street wall with setbacks at the third level. The proposed four-storey height limits interface with the reserve over on the sporting reserve and includes a two-storey street wall and setbacks at the upper two levels. Mm. So that's how it's been designed in that regard. The other question you raised around um, uh, why not limit the two-storey two development as well? The centre is becoming uh, to some underdevelopment pressure, as can be seen by the change in land use adjacent Roslyn and Barrable Roads, where you can continuously see now different commercial uses where it was previously residential. So they're expanding outside of the footprint of the village. A three-storey building has, only, has also been approved under the current policy where the Commonwealth Bank is located was recently approved. Implementing design guidelines through the UDF allows for redevelopment and renewal of the village and provides protection and inappropriate development by introducing building heights and setback guidelines that don't currently exist. And in reference to regarding the library, the questions you raised. So in line with the Geelong Regional Library Corporation infrastructure development plan, and the city's own social infrastructure plan, the height and library will be retained in its current location in the short to medium term, and a review is proposed to be undertaken in five years' time to determine the future options for the library. This does not mean it's proposed to be removed or otherwise, it's to consider what the future is and how it can support growth going forward as well. Thank you, Erin. Are you able to share the um, standards that say we should have four pedestrian crossings in 120 metres? You mean share the traffic assessment reports? Yeah. I'll check whether I made publicly available, I would assume so. But I'll check with that and we can come back to you if that's okay. Yep. Right, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Katarina is the best guy. Good evening. The Council's own data exchange websites talk about Geelong urban forest and the net tree gain over time. My question is, can the Council confirm whether the net tree gain over time information on the city web page includes trees and private and on the public land? You've got another question there. You might ask that one. We'll get the two answers for you. Okay. So, 
The councils on data exchange websites also talk about the number of trees and tree species identified at the, uh, and planted mostly in 2022. It does not talk about trees removed at the same time. Question. Can the council please indicate where residents can access information on the number of trees removed? Can the council please indicate where residents can access information on the tree loss in urban Geelong? Questions? Uh, go. <laughs> Thanks, Guy. Thank you, Katarina, for your questions. Uh, question one. Uh, the net tree gains over time information on the urban forest page on the Geelong Data Exchange only reflects changes to trees on public land. Uh, question two. The information on the number of public trees removed and the changes in the city's tree population can be found on the detailed view tab of the urban forest page on the Geelong Data Exchange. The annual removal numbers are shown in the net gain data and uh, residents can access this information uh, on the geelongdataexchange.com.au website. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thanks, Katarina. Thank you. Uh, Bill Marshall. During the August Council meeting, City Services responded that one of the actions in the Urban Forest Strategy Action Plan is to measure all KPIs or key performance indicators in 2020 and report the progress. Uh, the progress report is published on the Urban Forest Strategy Action page of the website. However, the Urban Forest Strategy Action page on the COGG website lists the KPIs but does not contain a 2020 or any KPI assessment and or progress report. The urban forest sections on the Geelong Data Exchange site contain very helpful information. However, the information doesn't respond to the actions and KPIs of the action plans, so there's a disconnect there. For example, the site contains undated data about the number of trees identified, but it does not reflect the city's canopy cover status and it also contains information about age, species and useful life expectancy, but it doesn't address progress on appropriateness and diversity. Question is, can the council provide information as to where residents can access the complete KPI assessment and progress report? That's my first question. Second question is, a um, little bit of background, the overview introduction on the COGG urgent urban forest data exchange page states the following. The city's urban forest strategy is focused on enhancing the public and private tree population in the suburbs and townships across Greater Geelong. The sum of all of these trees and associated vegetation is called the urban forest. Under the heading, how is our urban forest changing? The page reflects the total number of trees identified, the number of tree species identified, and the number of trees planted specifically in 2022. My question is this, can the council confirm whether the total number of trees identified reflects trees on public and on private land? And can the council confirm whether the number of trees planted specifically in 2022 reflects trees on public and on private land? Thanks, Bill. Uh, Guy? Yeah, thanks, uh, Bill, for your questions. Um, the 2020 update on key performance indicators is contained in the related documents section. On, in the, as part of the Urban Forest Strategy Action Plan, which is on our website. So that's the geelongaustralia.com.au website. Uh, question two, references to numbers of trees planted or removed relate to trees on public land. The city does not have a mechanism to count the number of trees planted or removed on private property. And question three, as per the previous answer, the number of trees planted refers to trees on public land. Thank you, Mr Smith. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Tina Smallman. Uh, 
Okay. Hello, everyone. Yeah. This is the first time I've done anything like this before. I just am compelled to come along and stand up for our beautiful little Heighton village. I love Geelong. I love Mel. Oh, sorry, I love Geelong. I love Heighton. Uh, we retired. This is a little bit of background. Sorry, I won't waste too much time. We retired uh, seven years ago to Geelong to beautiful Heighton. Uh, we were in uh, Melbourne, in a little, beautiful little suburb for 25 years, and we gradually watched it being destroyed by overdevelopment. And this is what I am terrified. <laughs> I'm terrified this is going to happen here. Um, as I said, I hope you love, love Geelong. I hope you love Heighton. My questions aren't slick, and I'm not a business person, but I'm speaking from the heart, and I'm reflecting the views of the majority of the Heighton residents. And so, the Heighton Village Urban Design Framework is unacceptable as is. Proposed three and four storey height limits are absolutely rejected by our community on the grounds that they will detract from the village's beauty and ambience, close off the sky, overshadow the trees and shoppers and lead our much-loved community hub along the path to becoming a generic run-of-the-mill shopping centre. Do you understand that Heighton Village is representative of the charm, uniqueness, history and livability that has drawn people to Geelong recently, myself included, and that the proposed height increases will ultimately detract from this success? Thanks, Tina. You've got another couple of questions. <laughs> Tina, Tina, do you want to just continue with the other questions, please? Yes. Uh, this is very, very important. I don't know if any of you have considered this aspect. Generic shopping centres are so common now. They're full of rushing, stressed people with no time to talk and certainly no inclination to hang about in an ugly environment. Anxiety has become a sad symptom of our modern society affecting all ages. Undeniably, fresh air, trees, bird life, space, sky, community connections and just a pleasant place to sit can alleviate the sadness. Do you appreciate and care that maintaining Height and Village as the leafy, people-friendly, low-rise, charming and special place it is now can promote happiness and better mental health in our community now and in the future? Please think about the future. Mm. question there about the, um, the clock tower. You wanted to mention that? If you, thank you. Um, you may think it's trivial. It's not trivial to heighten people. No one thinks it's trivial. I hope not. I really hope. I just sort of feel myself getting more cynical by the minute. <laughs> uh, anyway, the Heighton Village UDF is unacceptable as is. We have something unique in Heighton, something different, something people friendly, something that works something that ain't broke and doesn't need fixing, apart from a little TLC. It does need that. The charm, quirkiness and history of our little clock tower is a huge part of the attraction and ambience of the village. Surely Geelong Council loves and values its beautiful, iconic features and buildings, removing them at their peril. Will you leave our beloved and welcoming clock tower right where it is, please, where it is wanted and needed as a vital, vital and loved part of our village? It sort of, to me, it represents <laughs> what seems to be happening here. Thanks, yeah. Tina. What's Thanks, Gareth. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Tina, for attending tonight to read out the questions. We do appreciate it. So, um, the UDF, so in response to the three questions you've raised there, so the, the UDF introduces design guidelines to protect the village character from inappropriate development by introducing building height guidelines where none exist today. Mm -hmm. 
A mixture of development includes some three to four storey development. We'll maintain a village feel, locating jobs, shops, cafes, community services near to each other and providing access to everyday needs, creating active social places that people choose to spend time in. Want that. What if Heighton doesn't want that? Why thanks, is it in Tina, there? Why Tina, thanks. Yeah. The thanks, final, the final, Thank you, Mayor. Sorry. The final UDF does not specify the removal of the clock tower. Uh, rather, in responding to community feedback, it provides the opportunity for different installations to be considered in newly created open public spaces. And as I mentioned in one of the other questions, if and when funding is evolves throughout different aspects of the project, we continue to engage with the community through those processes and that's when those things are considered in more detail as well. And um, just within the, the, your third question is, I guess, the question about wanting to maintain that leafy, people-friendly, low-rise, charming special place, etc. Yes, we do. The objective of the UDS, UDF is to remain that leafy character and provide a, a public realm and an environment that is enjoyable for all as well. Thank you. Thanks, Gareth. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Tina. Trees don't like shade. They don't like... Tina, we've heard your yeah. questions. Thank you. I just ask you just refrain from yelling out. Thanks. Sally Kerner. Thank you for the opportunity to try once again. Can I just echo what's been said about height and, and beg you to consider that Packington Street runs from the river all the way to Church Street and we have something really precious, really unique, which needs to be um, valued and respected and preserved, not, not destroyed. My question is, due to... <laughs> due to recent approval being granted by councillors, to raise the overall building heights to a maximum of 10 storeys, 10 storeys at the Sale Yards development site, will City of Greater Geelong now commit to restricting building heights in Paco North to no more than three storeys to ease pressure on the area and its infrastructure? Thanks, Sally. Gareth Smith. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Sally. Has that mic worked? Yes, now it is working. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, thanks again for the question, Sally. Uh, when planning for infill development, individual character and infrastructure capacity is considered for each local neighbourhood. Does the design controls for Packington Street North will be considered based on the analysis and design review that is undertaken for specific to that local area. The sale yards precinct has been through the same local planning process and the building heights and design controls are subject to an independent review at an upcoming planning panel hearing. But they've been raised from one height just in a meeting like that. Approval's been given. How, that makes me worry terribly about transparency and honesty by council. Absolutely. Thanks, Sally. Uh, Andrew Kados. Thank you, Mayor and Councillors, the opportunity to address you this evening. I'm not used to being on this side of the council meeting. Um, my, I, I'm here tonight um, as a heightened resident, a long-time heightened resident. As you would well know, as many other speakers previously, the proposed heightened UDF. I have my question, I won't read it verbatim, um, but the UDF does contain a lot of good things. You're fixing the footpaths, lighting, uh, additional plantings where they're, they're, where they're um, sympathetic, uh, and, and general sprucing up of the, of the heightened village, which no one, no one in this room would think is a bad thing. But after a lot of discussions with a lot of people that I've spoken to, um, with business owners, there's certain aspects of the UDF which are just simply not supported by the majority, vast majority of the community. And they generally are the heights, the proposed four storeys, particularly adjacent to Nardi's celebrations. 
loss of car parking, a very elderly community in Highton who wants to park close to the shops. They don't want to walk far. The roundabout, which we do say it's not really a roundabout, but people like it, it works. And we should leave it alone. And also with regard to three pedestrian crossings, there's the central pedestrian crossing and there's going to be another two proposed in the space of 100 metres, which will be a disaster for traffic movement. And also the Barrable Road service entry. The um, uh, widening of the footpath, the planting of trees, removal of car parks, all for essentially one business that potentially has alfresco dining. So there's no, no support for that. So what I'm asking this evening, Council, is if you'll consider amending the height and UDF to take on board the majority of the, those issues that I've raised before as amendments so that the good things can be delivered to the community but the things that are not supported by the community are removed. Thanks, Andrew. And now, Gareth? I've got, do you want to ask the second one? It's very short. Go for it. Yep, thank you, Mayor. Um, the proposed Highton Village Urban Design Framework is seeking to remove the roundabout. The question I have is, is Council doing this at the behest of the Victorian State Government Department of Transport? I don't see that as one of your questions, Andrew, but in any event, uh, uh, Gareth. I can manage that. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. I can, I can uh, manage that, Mayor, as well. And thank you, Andrew. Nice to see you back in the chamber. Um, firstly, uh, around the four-storey building adjacent to Nardi celebrations, it was in the questions that you had asked, it's been incorrectly reported. Uh, that the extension of the retail space next to Nardi's is four storeys. The final UDF presented at Cancels tonight is a three-storey height limit for this site in line with all of Bellevue Avenue. Uh, regarding the, the touching on the parking, car parking losses, so an independent study of parking showed the demand for peak at 90% in off-street car parks during the week and at the weekend for less than one hour. Parking demand on street peaked at 70% during the week and lower on weekends. These findings show that there is always parking available in the village. The final UDF proposes a net loss of seven spaces to accommodate significant upgrades for the public realm. However, the potential future relocation of the library, which could be within the village, would result in a net gain of 13 car parks. On the removal of the roundabout that's proposed, uh, has been based on the recommendations from three independent traffic consultants, all of whom identified it is a non-compliant with its current standards as well as posing a safety risk. To directly answer your question, you just put it end around DOT, it's not driven by the state government, it's from independent consultants' advice to us. Uh, we engage with all relevant agencies, including DOT, on these type of advice, and they certainly haven't contradicted the, the advice we've been given by independent experts. Pedestrian crossings, Based on the State Government's movement and place framework, activity centres should be low speed environments given the concentration of pedestrians. The pedestrian crossings improve safety and accessibility for, for the most vulnerable road users, encouraging shoppers to visit more business in the village. And on the Barrable Road service entrance, access to the service road is maintained off Bellevue Avenue. Tree planting will be completed in accordance with the Australian standards to avoid causing any safety issues. And as I referred before, the other opportunities to expand our fresco. I, I noted your comment, there's one business there. They set up 30 year visions, which is to provide infrastructure that encourages new businesses to come and go as well, and particularly including the food and hospitality sector. Thanks, Andrew, again. Thank you, Andrew. Mayor and Councillors. Thank you. Jennifer Banto. Thank you, Mayor and Councillors. Um, I hear about item 2.3. Um, a 170 year old beautiful bluestone building had to be deconstructed with the duplication of Bowen Heads Road. It 
and major road projects carefully dismantled it. They employed archaeologists and specialist uh, heritage firms and they've carefully stored the blue stone, the slate, the windows and doors uh, and uh, um, red bricks, interior walls. And that's in storage now. Uh, with imagination and flair, we have the opportunity for a sensational result here. Uh, in Marshalltown, not a tentative second best compromise. This is a one-time chance for Marshall's exceptional industrial heritage to be recognised. Marshall's almost disappeared. Its history is vitally important. It can be recognised with the reconstruction of this house in the appropriate place with the appropriate techniques. There are three important aspects to the decision you're making tonight between option one and option three. Option one is the one preferred by the Marshalltown community group, and that's now upward of 800, nine, nearly 900 people. The, uh, the three important things are the location, the authenticity of the rebuild, and the future use. Cottage on its original site at the intersection of Tannery and Bowen Heads Road was a well-known Marshall landmark. It needs to be re relocated in an appropriate place, which is diagonally opposite on the field where the tennis court is. That's possible. We've been out and measured it since the new curbing has been made. There's plenty of room. It's a small building. It's about half the size of a tennis court. There's still plenty of room there on that high visibility uh, landmark site. That's where it should go. The alternative in option three is uh, a recessed area hidden by car parks, uh, you, can't, you can't see it very well from any direction. You have to break your neck to see it. Uh, the location on the intersection of Tannery and, Marsh and uh, Bowen Heads Road, you can see it from four directions, and it would be a very good location. What does that mean? <laughs> question, Jennifer. Oh, um, will Council please amend the officer's recommendation? for uh, option three and go with option one for the location, also for the authenticity of the rebuild. Option three seeks to just make a shell of a house, the blue stone just on the outside and the inside not a proper uh, reconstruction according to borough charter principles. The major road projects took a massive high-tech video of the house uh, as it was being deconstructed. They can zone in on every lintel, on every windowsill, on the special stones, the coin stones on the corners. It can be rebuilt authentically with its chimneys, not faux chimneys that are proposed in option three. So we have the knowledge and the materials Holmes Glen TAFE, which is the only place in Victoria where a stonemason can get qualified, have expressed an interest in uh, having students help with this project. It would be a rare opportunity for them to do so. So we've got the location and the authenticity, the best option being option one. The future use. We propose that it become Marshalltown History House with multiple uses, including tourism information, because people coming from the south to Geelong don't have a tourist information on that side of town. A, a repository for archival records of Marshall's significant industrial history, as well as local group usage, school groups and coach tours, as we do have at National Trust Houses. And the added advantage of provision of public convenience for users of the adjacent tennis court and playground. So will council please amend the recommendation and put option one where it currently says option three. Thanks, Jennifer. We'll go to Gareth. <laughs> Thanks, Gareth. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Jennifer, for your, your continued great work in this heritage space. We do appreciate it. 
Um, in response to the three questions you asked, so with the first question, several factors were considered in selecting a preferred site uh, for the rebuilt cottage. Location within the historical area of Marshalltown was paramount, visibility from the main road and accessibility. Both options one and three occur within Marshalltown. Option one might offer marginally better visibility than option three. However, it lacks the ease of access and safety provided to the latter, that being option three, in that parking is more distant and not readily apparent, and there are potential safety issues should visitors try to park along the side of either road to take photos or to enter the cottage near that roundabout. <coughs> Excuse me. In regard to question two, the city's heritage advice is that the borough charter allows for flexibility when accommodating sustainable new uses into an historical building and for buildings where relocation is the only means of ensuring their survival, then greater flexibility is allowed over buildings being conserved upon their original site. In regard to question three, the only use related differences between one and three are that option three provides better accessibility and the partial removal of some internal petitions, as you've highlighted, will accommodate larger groups of people and more diverse uses and improved safety and security through better sight lines. Retention of all internal petitions, as proposed in option one, would leave small rooms in which it would be difficult for more than six people to interact, inter interact in any activity. Thanks again. Thanks. We have addressed all those issues in our response. It's attachment two in your uh, papers. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, Angela Mangan. resident of Geelong West in the Paco North precinct and my submission and questions relate to the Paco North UDF and the community engagement process. Sarah McHugh confirmed today that I would have nine minutes to speak at this meeting. At the previous COG meeting the issue was raised about the lack of proper community consultation and engagement relating to the Paco North UDF. There is a requirement by COG under its own community engagement policy to, and I quote, to use methods to produce the most meaningful feedback and participants are to have access to appropriate information and time and space to deliberate. I would like to provide details of some examples of how COG has not adhered to its own community engagement policy during the PACO UDF consultation process. I kept records because it was so gobsmacking to me that COG, COG would even consider it appropriate to release such important documents when residents were dealing with COVID lockdown situations. Some of the specific instances where COG did not adhere to its own community engagement policy are as follows. One, releasing the interim final draft of the UDF on the first day Geelong went into a COVID pandemic lockdown on the 6th of August 2021, obviously meant people were focused on other issues, were unable to gather, hold public meetings or street meetings, or interact in a normal way due to the COVID restrictions which prevented meaningful feedback from residents. Point two. COG did not include information about the UDF on its own Facebook page or put up bench seat posters in the PACO Heritage Corps publicising the UDF until the five week mark of the original six week public consultation period. This only occurred after members of the Geelong West community contacted COG about the community at large being unaware of the UDF. Point three. It is a requirement in COG's own engagement policy, and I quote, participants have access to appropriate information and time and space to deliberate. COG released the traffic impact assessment report less than 24 hours before the UDF public feedback deadline closed. It was released after the close of business on the 23rd of September, 2021. 
This was also on the eve of a public holiday long weekend when most people would not have been aware this had been released. This allowed no time for residents to assess the 35-page report and provide feedback. In December last year, when the final PACO UDF was due to be uploaded onto the COG website, we had been originally advised this would be made available one week before it was being voted on by council. It ended up being uploaded on the Friday before the Tuesday COG meeting, leaving no time for residents to be able to assess it, despite us being originally told it would be available one week beforehand. Conflicting information was provided over a number of days by various people at COG about the UDF document availability date. Point five. During the further community engagement period for the PACO North UDF in September 2022, the on-street neighbourhood chats with, Co with a COG urban planner and residents was conducted on noisy and windy streets with no seating provided, so it was not conducive for discussion and was an inappropriate setting. Some residents, when wanting to register for these chats, were told that they were full. How can an on-street meeting be full when no COVID gathering restrictions applied? And some were told by COG they could not attend for this reason. And others registered but never received emails providing details of the meeting locations. An urban planner new to the UDF who attended these chats could not answer many questions. These questions were noted down by the consultant, but to the best of my knowledge, answers were not provided afterwards directly to those who asked them. Instead, the questions were included as issues raised in the consultant's report, but with no answers provided. The Thursday 18th of August 2022 webinar with urban planning was conducted the week before these on-street chat meetings and was arranged with only a matter of days notice, giving inadequate time for residents to be aware of it and register. When I contacted council to say this was inadequate short notice of this webinar, I was told that was the only time and date the urban planners were available. Letters were hand delivered by council to Paco North only residents mailboxes on Saturday the 13th of August and the original closing <coughs> date for people to register and submit questions was Monday the 15th of August. A totally inadequate time frame given people would probably not check their mailboxes on a weekend. This deadline was eventually extended to Wednesday the 17th of August <coughs> after repeated requests and complaints. But anyone reading the council delivered letter, which referred to Monday the 15th of August as the deadline, would have assumed they'd missed that deadline and may not have bothered to do anything. The formal letter, a formal mailed letter from council arrived in the post on Tuesday the 16th of August, referring to the deadline as being Monday the 15th of August, which had passed. People who'd used the chat function during the webinar said afterwards, many of their pre-submitted questions were not answered during the webinar or subsequently. Point seven, the only, tall, only town hall style meeting that has been held during this entire UDF process was the one arranged by the Help Save PACO Geelong West community itself and was held on the 10th of, 10th of September with 170 residents attending with Brownville councillors uh, Mansfield and Conchell attending. We asked when organising this meeting if it was possible for a senior urban design team member to attend and that request and information was declined. COG has never instigated or organised a town hall meeting with residents. It was left to residents to arrange this. Point eight, the May-June parking plan meeting held between council and PACO traders. It was stated on the COG website that this would not include residential parking concerns and that this issue would be dealt with separately and at a later date. These meetings with residents on parking have not occurred as indicated. When will these occur? The whole engagement process has been about COG in imposing its view on residents, and it's been a one-way flow and therefore not, has not been actual engagement. It appears that COG has structured this entire engagement process with the objection, objective of minimising community, community engagement and feedback rather than maximising it as it is required under its own engagement policy. By releasing documents on the day Geelong went into a lockdown, or on the eve of public holidays, or within short 24-hour timeframes before public comment periods closed, 
made, made the registration process of neighbourhood chat meetings difficult and locations of these on-street meetings were not fit for purpose. Virtually all the community engagement to publicise the UDF has been done by the Geelong West community via the Help Save PACO Facebook group, not by COG. Or publicity has only occurred by COG after residents have been, have, sorry, have made repeated contact with COG to complain. Residents should not have to be doing COG's job. The recent further community engagement period was less than one month. The neighbourhood chat sessions failed to address resident concerns. Residents felt angered at this being a re-education campaign and not being genuine community engagement. And it was out of this that the Help Save PACO group contacted the Brownville councillors to request a town hall meeting. I recently read an article about what defines good urban planning. The overseas urban planner interviewed commented that for urban planning projects to be successful, Residents in the community need to be genuinely embraced and brought in and involved as a genuine part of the process and recognise local knowledge and the impact on residents who have to live with the final result are all vital pieces of input into successful urban planning and design outcomes. This same urban planner commented that bad urban planning process and bad outcomes result when urban planners treat the community and residents as adversaries and obstacles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Angela? Sorry, I've got you, one, just one more, one more paragraph. Are you close? Said, I am. Thank you. One minute. To have our questions minimised or disregarded and be described by some as NIMBYs is offensive in the extreme. We are not against sensitive development and genuine rejuvenation, but are totally opposed to the overdevelopment proposed in the final PACO North UDF. My two questions are, question one, will council please acknowledge and confirm, so it is placed on public record, that the COG engagement events I've outlined above occurred as I have described. Question two, will the City of Greater Geelong stop the Packington Street North UDF process and instead begin adequate community consultation that is transparent and genuine? Thank you. The following community engagement was undertaken by the City for the pre preparation of the Packington Street UDF. Due to COVID restrictions, some of the engagement had to change. All engagement was designed to ensure it was fitting to the specific phase and goal of that engagement. And just to outline those four phases that have occurred since 2018, first phase was to establish a shared vision. That was from March to April in 2018 several in-person workshops with 72 people attending as well as a survey conducted in total 320 submissions and 510 survey responses were received in march to august 2020 feedback on the draft udf this involved online forums with 51 participants written submissions and online feedback in total 77 written submissions were received during that phase we introduced an interim final UDF, which is an unusual practice to go out again for the consultation on a draft. In total, 379 submissions were received. A local campaign opposing interim final UDF was initiated. This occurred during the six, from the 6th of August to 24th of September 2021. And then the fourth phase was to help increase an understanding of Packington Street North Precinct it was the 11th of August to 11th of September 2022. So it can be confirmed that these are the consultation meeting dates that did occur and have occurred. And in regard to question two, in regard to the timing of a future decision with consideration by council, a decision on the Packington North Precinct is scheduled for next month's council meeting in November. Thanks again, Angela. Can I just ask one further question then? Do you consider that- Angela, Angela, you've had over 10 minutes and there's other people waiting to ask questions. Thank you. 
Uh, Caitlin Kirby. Mr. Mayor and Councillors, uh, I again preface these questions with the fact that I'm a resident of Geelong West who is pro-responsible development via legitimate community engagement through every single step of the UDF process. My first question is, now that the community engagement report for the Packington North UDF has been presented, how does your team plan to respond to the issues that were highlighted during consultation and ensure solutions are reflected in the final UDF? For the record, the main concerns were building heights, how truly upsetting for the residents that live directly next to the proposed 30 meter plus residential commercial buildings. Number two, significantly increasing traffic volume in an area that already struggles with traffic concerns at peak times and a lack of parking options. Number three, destroying a di distinctly unique, historically valued and celebrated piece of Geelong heritage with multiple four, six, and uh, I think somebody said 10. I thought it was eight story buildings. Number four, a lack of neighborhood services and amenities required to support the projected population volume. Uh, number five, uh, placing a significant amount of additional stress on an area that already feels the negative impact of decrepit infrastructure. Um, it appears flagged environmental concerns such as developing in an area that already has little to no green space for families specifically. Um, and also pedestrian safety concerns were missed in the presented report. Um, I have two other questions, but if I can only say one. Just keep going. Two. Yeah. Um, will the final Packington North UDF complete with amendments that reflect the public's concerns be available for the public to view, comment on prior to next month's meeting? If so, by what date? And if not, what is the reason? And number three, do you believe that less than do you believe that less than one month is an appropriate time frame for members of council to review the final Packington North UDF and confidently vote on it? Thank you for those questions, Caitlin. Uh, the Packington North Precinct is, as I mentioned just before, scheduled for next meeting, next yes. council meeting. The report will, will include a response to the key issues raised during the last consultation. Okay. It's our standard practice. And question two, uh, again, it refers to the November meeting, but as per normal practice, documents are released when the agenda is published on council's website, and this occurs the Friday before the council meeting, as was the case for this meeting. It's a standard practice that we at least have for this organisation. And then your third question is, councillors have been engaged in the consultation process for the Packington Street and Gordon Avenue there since 2018 and adopted the Gordon Avenue and Heritage Core precincts in Packington Street UDF in December 21. Um, so they're well engaged, well informed throughout and the themes you highlighted earlier can obviously have continued through a period of time in different areas. So it won't be new information come to the councillors, so I wouldn't consider in light of it's a short period of time for the councillors to consider this current recent feedback. Thank you again. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank uh, Claude Eagles. Good evening. I'm uh, very new at this, so, uh, and I think everything pretty well that I've done has been said. Uh, this village is, has a particular charm, and the resident friendly, not oversized like most shopping centres are. Parking is just adequate with the loss of the huge number of car park spaces, extra shopping, and high density units above the shops. This is going to destroy the area, destroy the parking, create traffic hazards with an increased traffic. Who is the company who suggested the update of the village to their financial gain at the community's loss? I understand that the land that this development's on is Crown land. Is this going to be sold to a private identity? What is going to be done to stop the threat of flooding? Uh, 
I know I didn't have that in my question, but as this is a known flood area, as I've personally seen it flat, Harvey's, Harvey's Fruit Shop has sandbags at the door right now for a flood emergency. Developers, of, developers often building buildings, but there is a problem with the building. The developers are well gone, leaving the new owners with the problem. As the building would be over the water course, there could be problems. I believe it is an unnecessary development and destroy the village atmosphere has, that has taken years to get to where it is. Uh, and that's about all I've got to say. Thank you. Stay there, Claude. Claude. Thanks, Gary. Keeps turning itself off. Thank you, Claude, again for coming this evening to ask the questions. Uh, the three questions you did raise. So the proposed height limit for this potential future development site is three storeys. That's the one next to the Nardi site, uh, rather than four storeys. The development of the site will be subject to a future feasibility study. The site is not currently for sale to anybody. Question two. An independent study of parking showed the demand had peaked at 90% in off-street car parks during the week and at the weekend for less than one hour. Parking demand on street peaked at 70% during the week and lower on the weekends. These findings show that there's always parking available in the village. The final UDF proposes a net loss of seven spaces to accommodate significant upgrades for public realm. However, the potential future relocation of the library would result in a net gain of 13 parking spaces, as I referred to one of the earlier questions. And then regarding the flooding aspects, that you raise a really good points around that, the height and flood study, a separate report, identifies areas of high hazard flooding within the precinct. These were considered as part of the project. Public realm works offer those opportunities to improve the situation, particularly the car park adjacent to Barrable Road and Heighton Reserve and Taylor Court. For any future development that may occur in the area, potential flooding must be considered and appropriate measures must be put in place. The guidelines make some suggestions to protecting buildings from flooding while still achieving good public realm outcomes. Thanks again for coming along this evening. Thanks, Claude. Uh, David Spears. Um, first of all, Heighton Village is a lovely village. I like it. It's been the same for a long time. Um, the last development I think there was when the roundabout might have been put in and the automatic toilets, which is good. Um, my, my observations there right now, and I'll just make this observation, I, and that is that I can't see the social need or the financial need to reinvest in the place and change it. That's just an observation. The next observation is the safety, which has come up. Um, the only safety hazards I know there is massive trip tripping hazards for tree roots on the footpath. And summer's coming right now and they will have to be fixed. There, I don't see any other safety hazards. Okay, um, get to my questions. Um, you've probably got a copy of my questions. Um, look, I, I'll, I think I have to read this out. Um, reduction in parking lots, uh, it's been covered and covered a lot here already. I'll just whip through it though. Um, yes, I do like going there knowing that there's probably a, f a parking lot right down the back somewhere. You know, 80 and 90 per cent parking is good. Um, now, we're going to lose a few, but there are, a problem I see is the retail uh, increase and the extra buildings, oh, I think they're going to be accommodation. Now, they always park out in the streets now and accommodation, any new buildings, um, they're going to bring more, more cars in anyway. So my, my question really is, um, what actions can be implemented to restore the attractive shopping centre with, um, if the experts get the parking wrong, and uh, I've read the, uh, the uh, consultants' reports, um, they might be wrong in the future. We might have more of those big utes and 
more electric cars. Uh, what's a, how can it be reinstalled in the future? Um, the, the last comment, uh, and this is only a comment, that uh, a few times you've made references to the Australian standards. Um, the current Australian standards, half of civil works in Australia doesn't really comply with the current standards. I don't see a need to change what we've got uh, just to bring them up to the Australian current standards, um, the civil works. Um, thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Gary. Uh, thank you, David. Look, the final UDF proposed the development of a parking precinct plan to ensure parking time limits are more closely reflecting the needs of the businesses and the services in the village. By doing so, it is possible to increase the utilisation of existing parking supply. And as I've mentioned before, and I won't repeat it, obviously the final you'd have to propose is a, a net loss of seven spaces, but there potentially is an increase subject to what happens with the library in that regard as well. Thank you again, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Simon Nardi. Good evening. Um, so I've been uh, working in the Bellevue Avenue um, height and shopping strip for the last 19 years and believe I have a great feel for the height and village's strengths and weaknesses. Um, for me, the biggest weakness um, the village has, and I, I think 90% 90, 90 of the community, community can acknowledge, is car parking. Um, with the current UDF, there will be considerably less car parking, um, and um, nine, nine car parks uh, less is, I don't believe that's true when you're building a, f a building of 500 square metres, um, that doesn't add up. Um, so yeah, um, in a growing region of Victoria, more car parks are needed to future-proof the village. How can a new develop development be considered without more car parks for the community? Thanks, Simon. Uh, Gareth? Thank you, Simon. There we go. Right, yeah, uh, thank you for the question, Simon. So an independent study of parking showed at the 90% in all off-street car parks during the week and at weekend for less than one hour. Parking demand on street peaked at 70% during the week and lower on the weekends. These findings show there's always parking available in the village. And as I referred to the other questions, of course, as well, the final UDF does propose a net loss of seven spaces to accommodate significant upgrades to the public realm. But again, this could potentially be offset with 13 car parks, depending on the future of the library location, where it may be within that village area as well. Um, there is a detailed assessment that done that, so we're very confident around those figures that we've presented in the report. Yeah, in all due respect, I've been there for 19 years. I'm there five to six days a week, every week. They're there for potentially one week of what could be, a, you know, a not a busy time. Um, and that's not true and the traders can back me up on that one. And I think, you know. <laughs> so, Thank you. I'm no, I'm no traffic expert, but. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, Thanks, so we've heard you. Uh, Prue Beck. Rubeck, no. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Paddy Siler. Uh, the red by Sally, is it? Yep. Thank you. I believe um, Paddy emailed councillors with a copy of this map. Does everyone have access to it? I have copies here if you'd like to have one in front of you. Yeah, Is we've there all anyone got one. who needs one? We've all got one. Fantastic. Thanks for that. And uh, I have a copy of the, um, 
the traffic report. I found it interesting. I think it was said that three traffic reports were done on Highton. We've had one. Please refer to unique Geelong West Street pattern map supplied under separate cover. My two questions are about the substandard traffic network impact assessment on the UDF. Question one. With reference to the unique Geelong West Street pattern highlighter map, please note carefully that Geelong West has very few north-south alternative streets to Paco and is a vastly different street pattern compared to the typical 250 metre interval tartan grid that you can see in the Geelong CBD and in other comparable inner city Melbourne suburbs that have a regular grid of major roads and laneways. Geelong West streets cannot absorb concentrated traffic density. As such, the management strategy on page four of the traffic network assessment, which states that, quote, as specific roads, streets, intersections become more congested, a redistribution of traffic naturally occurs as a proportion of drivers find alternative quicker routes is an absolute fantasy notion and a failure of responsible urban design and the future repercussions of traffic congestion would be severe on both residents and business. The question is, does council now recognise that the traffic objections ex expressed by so many ordinary residents in the consultation period are actually based in an objective reality of the existing street layout? And I would add, we've had a fatality on Packington Street and in my street, I had a child hit recently. Question two, the management strategy on page four, which, which states that, quote, in order to minimise the impact on residential streets, local area traffic management measures such as traffic calming, parking restrictions and one-way traffic movements should be explored and, where appropriate, implemented, end quote. On Isabella, Britannia, Clonard and Collins Street, you would have to drive about 800 metres from Paco before you reach the first north-south intersection, being at Elizabeth Street, which is already an extremely heavily used but small-scale neighbourhood street with historical serious resident concerns about pedestrian access and safety. Does Council now recognise that one-way streets are unlikely to be a feasible solution? to handle increased traffic on Paco and that one-way streets would create a range of problematic, problematic consequences in Elizabeth Street and Shannon Avenue and that the UDF, which only studied a very small area of the traffic map, as in the dotted black line that is only running from um, Church Street down to Gordon Avenue, doesn't look at anything on the other side or the big picture, um, do... Uh, sorry and that the UDF, which only studied a very small area of the traffic map, is therefore deeply flawed by relying on such ill-considered traffic analysis. Thanks, Gareth. Uh, thanks, Mayor, and thank you, Paddy, for those two questions. Uh, the concept of traffic redistribution is well established but is not relied upon as the sole mitigation strategy for future traffic demand in the study area. The city expedited an action in the final UDF to prepare a public parking plan for Packington Street. The city is also currently undertaking the development of integrated transport plan for Geelong which will inc include proposals for more balanced transport systems that is res less reliant on private cars by encouraging a shift to public transport, walking, cycling... What happen? <laughs> ..and various forms of rideshare options. Furthermore, the final UDF proposes that a local traffic management plan is developed to mitigate issues for residents. Finally, all planning applications are individually assessed for traffic impacts and must demonstrate available capacity in the existing and the future road networks. And in regards that, to question two. In your report, it shows two streets, mm -hmm. Spring Street and Autumn Street East are already beyond capacity. Mm -hmm. They're big red, yeah. over 167% capacity. Yeah. Thank you. Capacity. Thanks, Patty. So, and then with regard to question two, the one-way street is suggested as a local area traffic management measure, which amongst other measures suggested, should be explored, so it's exploration of it. This is future work of part of the UDF implementation, which is 
part of a normal process. Thank you again, Patrick. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Sally. Uh, Catherine Talbot. Thanks, Catherine. Hello, good evening, Mr Mayor and councillors and the gallery tonight. Wow, I have to say it's a big night tonight, a common theme of overdevelopment and listening to the community. My question... <laughs> My questions relate to Dean Street, Belmont, where the council are planning on another overdevelopment, developing a narrow um, land, piece of land with a large housing estate that can be up to three storeys high on a rare community plantation reserve set aside in the initial development of the area over 50 years ago. After a community consultation process that a majority of residents said no to and a petition with over 700 signatures, we too are concerned with council practices, like what I'm hearing tonight, and lack of transparency, such as missing building reports, deeming buildings being unsafe um, before the removal, a councillor selling their adjoining property after the feasibility study was completed before the public were informed. <laughs> Whilst the council is engaging a community housing provider to develop a plan for 5A Dean Street, is there also a plan being developed for community consultation that shows what the space will look like if retained as a community open space, such as parkland, community garden, playground, or other community facilities? Since this is what residents asked for during the Have Your Say process and our 700 plus signature petition. Do Council also plan to run an open, con open consultation process such as have your say that allows community members to contribute ideas about what they want to see the site used for in retaining it as public open space? My second question, I urge the Council to do a traffic impact study on the Dean Street site. We have continuously voiced this from the start. The streets and laneways that surround Dean Street, in particular Dorothy Avenue and Lloyd Street, are incredibly busy. Why is it being left up to those developing the site when this is too late? Surely it would be a priority before a decision on the site is made. Considering Dean Street and Dorothy Avenue with the Oberon Primary School are both extremely busy and dangerous during school pickup and drop off times. It's almost impossible to drive down them. The TLC staff car park further contributes to traffic congestion on the street. I urge councillors to view this for themselves at 3.15 on any given school day at the busiest time when the school is dismissed. My third question, has the TLC aged care facility been consulted by the council? Given their property runs the whole length of the Dean Street site, what concerns or feedback have they raised about the impacts on their vulnerable residents? Their property has several emergency exits that lead onto the site. Thank you. Thanks, Mine's playing up now. now Robin Stevens, uh, Director of Community Life. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Mayor Marahi, and thanks, Catherine, for your questions. Lovely to see you again. Um, firstly, I'll just say that um, no decision around the level or scale of development has been made on uh, the Dean Street site. The city intends to undertake a collaborative design process in 2023, so collaborative will be engagement and opportunities for participation, to work together with the appointed housing provider and the local community on the potential social housing developments as the first priority option. We have taken on board the community feedback regarding open space, and when we're working with a social housing provider, we will form collective views on options for use of the site, um, and noting council has not yet made a decision on the site, which won't be until after the collaborative design process has been completed. 
In terms of your second questions, we have heard your concerns about traffic and access and parking from the local community. The impacts on the adjoining neighbourhood will be considered as part of the next steps of the investigation and the community engagement process, so there'll be an opportunity for pe people to contribute there. Uh, your third question in relation to the TLC aged care facility. As part of the uh, undertaking of the collaborative design process in 2023, we'll work together with the appointed community housing provider and key stakeholders such as TLC Aged Care um, and the wider community to be consulted as part of the uh, planned process. Thanks, Catherine, for your questions tonight. Thank you for hearing them. Thank you. Uh, Dr Jane Moody. You got three questions, Jane. The uh, Jessica Sullivan's question. You have that. Go with that one first. Go with that one first. Sorry. Go with that one first. The Was one from Jessica. One? Oh, okay. Yep. Um, uh, uh, these questions are on behalf of Jess Sullivan, um, and regard the Paco North UDF. Question one. Noting a UDF clause already exists in the planning scheme that was developed through extensive consultation, why are Council seeking to unduly influence the community by refusing to do urgent maintenance and repair work on Packington Street North until this specific iteration of the UDF is passed? Question two. The North Packington Street UDF references the Housing Strategy 2007 from which the Settlement Strategy was developed as a key driver for the North Packington Street UDF. Both these strategies, as well as the original UDF framework and current clauses of the planning scheme, all make various references to discouraging building heights above three storeys in increased housing diversity areas and discouraging building heights that are more than one storey above the prevailing building height on Packington Street North specifically. Why then have all public consultation documents for the Packington Street North UDF exceeded and disregarded these guidelines? Thank you, Mayor. Thanks for reading out the questions on behalf of Jessica as well. So with regard to question one on the maintenance issues, Council's program for urgent repairs is fully separated from the preparation of a long-term strategic planning document such as the proposed UDF. They are separate parts of the organisation that deal with that. One does not affect the other. Question two, the increased housing diversity areas, the IHDAs, policy applies to residential neighbourhoods, not commercial shopping strips. Packington Street is a commercial shopping strip. As noted in the aforementioned documents, the IHDA is a transition area between commercial zones and the lower rise residential areas. And UDFs are updated to reflect changing conditions, including population growth, employment demand and retail demand. Thanks again. Thanks, Gareth. I, I would like to say, though, there are many people who have who feel that maintenance of the streets in Paco North has not been done for ages. And actually, some of the councillors who we understand. came to the we understand. community meeting acknowledged that. You, you've got another question, Jane, for Agreed. this time from Brendan Quirk. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so these questions are from Brendan Quirk um, and they reference, uh, relate to the City of Greater Geelong's interactions with the Victorian State Government regarding town planning outcomes for Geelong West. Question one. 
Has the City of Greater Geelong, including its representatives, mayor, councillors, council officers or otherwise, formally sought to acquire or have acquired from the Victorian State Government the Geelong Rail Maintenance Yards that in the proposed Packington North Precinct UDF make up the area of the proposed eight-storey development and public space in these plans? If not, why is, not, is this not included in the proposed UDF as um, is usual, is the, sorry, which is the usual practice? I do. Uh, question two, has the City of Greater Geelong, including its representatives, mayor, councillors, council officers or otherwise, written or communicated to the Victorian State Government requesting that the C300 planning amendment as adopted and passed by the council and state government be repealed or cancelled to allow for greater development in Geelong West and or Greater Geelong, as was the Council's intention prior to the residents and community groups opposing this and lobbying for the current outcome. Ms. Gareth. Uh, thanks, Jane, again for reading out Brendan's questions as well. So with regard to question one, neither the City nor Council has sought to acquire this site. A UDF is not bound by the land ownership. The Geelong Rail Maintenance Yards is an area which is considered part of the Packing, Packington North Precinct, as you know very well, it butts the actual roadway there. Um, so we do actually look at all, owner, um, all lands, doesn't matter about the ownership, to set, set a future vision in UDFs. With regard to question two, it is neither Council's intention nor is it even necessary to repeal or cancel Planning Scheme Amendment C300. Planning Scheme Amendment C300 applies to the residential areas across the city, including Geelong West. It does not apply to shopping strips and commercial areas such as Packington Street. C300 limits development in residential streets in Geelong West, and this continues to be Council's policy. The UDF directs medium density housing development to the north end of Packington Street and Gordon Avenue to minimise development pressures and protect the neighbourhood character in those residential areas. Thanks, Thanks, Gareth. Jane. Gareth, can I just qualify for you? Because Jane, I'm have you got a question of your own? Jane, have you got... Is it up to my questions now? Yep, yes, your question now, please. On oh, my questions? Yep. Right. Um, I just wanted to say, and this seemed important, with that first question before about the um, rail yard site, has COG formally sought with the State Government to purchase the Geelong Rail Maintenance Yards because I understand this would be a part of Council process in the formation of the Paco North UDF? Uh, that's the question you just referred to, is it, regarding the purchase? Oh, but I, I didn't hear you expressly refer to that, did I? Uh, yeah, I did. I it referred to, no, we've had not approached... You've done nothing. Yeah, yeah. OK, no, thank there's you. There's been no, no approach by the city or council to approach regarding a purchase of the land. Okay, thank you. Uh, just to clarify, Jane, if it, hopefully it assists, is the UDF sets vision for all landowners. Council obviously doesn't need to own or control how that sets a guideline in it. So regarding... We're actually... The plan sets our vision for private landowners. Again, it's not, never our intention we would purchase that. It sets a vision to guide future development. Okay, thank you for that clarification, Mr Smith. Um, my personal questions are these. Um, a resident of Elizabeth Street told me that the City of Greater Geelong removed the chicanes on Elizabeth Street, Geelong West, years ago, so more traffic could flow down Elizabeth Street because there was already too much traffic going down Shannon Avenue and the northern end of Packington Street. I understand there are many residents who are concerned about the high volume of traffic along Elizabeth Street and the many dangers this poses. I also understand that there have been numerous communications with City of Greater Geelong officers and councillors about the problems, including an on-street meeting with residents and some councillors to explain the traffic problems and possible solutions. The street pattern of Geelong West surrounding the northern part of Packington Street is very old and was never designed with future population, in growth, uh, population growth in mind. Typical street grids in Melbourne suburbs have evenly distributed streets that run in both an east-west as well as a north-south direction. 
The area surrounding the northern part of Packenden Street is unique in that it has very limited street connectivity that runs north-south and which Patty Siler um, explained in the map that she uh, was discussed by Sally Cooner earlier that tonight. Um, there's Packington Street and Shannon Avenue and only narrow Elizabeth Street that runs between these. The traffic assessment report that was released late last year does not provide any assessment of the current traffic problems along Elizabeth Street or Shannon Avenue uh, that result from this unique lack of connectivity. The study area was extremely narrow and excluded any analysis of the current pressure on Elizabeth Street or Shannon Avenue and their intersections to determine the impact of further traffic being directed there as a result of the overdevelopment proposed in the Packington North UDF. Question one. Can Cog please confirm when and why the chicanes were removed from Elizabeth Street? And given that Council is well aware of the history of traffic problems along Elizabeth Street, why was it and Shannon Avenue not included in the scope of the traffic assessment? And why was a proper traffic assessment not performed as a requirement of the Paco North UDF? Question two. The City of Greater Geelong and some councillors have been well aware of the resident concerns about the existing traffic conditions and problems along Elizabeth Street for some time. Can Cog please explain why residents should not hold them accountable for knowingly creating more dangerous traffic conditions by pushing ahead with this ill-considered overdevelopment of Packington North? Uh, my final question is, the Help Save Packington Street Resident Action Group has produced a new hard copy petition which says, we oppose the proposed high-rise development in the Packington North Precinct, according to the final urban design framework, because we are concerned about its adverse impacts on amenity, local traffic, parking and the destruction of the soul and character of our neighbourhood. We demand that the City of Greater Geelong stop the Packington Street North UDF process and instead begin adequate community consultation that is transparent and genuine. We started collecting signatures on Saturday, just gone. Despite the inclement weather after the flooding, we've already collected over 250 resident signatures and as of today, more than 300. And we will continue collecting more. While speaking to people that passed by on Packington Street, I was, I was personally struck by how many said they'd come from far away to enjoy a really pleasant day shopping in... <laughs> in Packington Street, of course. Um, places like Anglesey, Barwon Heads, Torquay, Melbourne, Sunshine, East Geelong, Manifold Heights, and there was even a lady from Birigurra. When these people looked at the map showing the overdevelopment proposed in the Packington Street North UDF, all of these visitors were absolutely shocked and amazed that the city of Greater Geelong would even be considering this. All of them said that regrettably they would have to find somewhere else to dine and shop due to the increased traffic and car parking problems and they were all really sad to think that the soul of Packington Street would be destroyed. Question. Why is the city of Greater Geelong not taking steps to protect Packington Street and the things that make it so attractive to visitors? Why aren't they developing a plan that extends these attractive features from the heritage core along the northern end of Packington Street? Jane. Uh, Gareth, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Jane, for those additional questions as well. Uh, in regard to Elizabeth Street, so the chicanes were removed between 2005 and 2009 and replaced with speed humps along that street. Speed humps are considered a more effective treatment to physically control driver speed. Both Elizabeth Street and Shannon Avenue were outside of the commercial zone of Packington Street, which was the focus, of course, of the UDF, <laughs> uh, pressure saying. As such, there was no requirement to conclude these streets or any of the other ones in those traffic assessments. <laughs> in question two, 
Elizabeth Street is outside the commercial zone for Packing Street, which is a focus of the UDF. As such, there was no requirement to include these streets. There is no evidence that the proposed development of Packington North will create d dangerous traffic conditions on Elizabeth Street. Your own traffic assessment said Question that traffic three. would divert and find other, other ways to move. Um, Sorry, Ask the questions. Can you just allow Gareth to answer, thanks? I am. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. So go to question three, the standard process to update UDS in responding to changing conditions, including population growth, the demand for employment and retail space, the need for public realm upgrades, as well as the need to address urban degeneration and decay. In addition to addressing these changing conditions, the Packington North Precinct clearly needs renewal. Unlike the Heritage Core Precinct, the North Precinct does warrant the same heritage does not, sorry, warrant the same heritage protection. At the same time, it is important to protect the retail experience in the heritage core, rather than putting at risk by encouraging more of the same in the northern precinct. The aim is to create the opportunity for more diverse retail commercial service offering in the north precinct that will complement rather than compete with our valuable heritage core. All our visitors don't agree with you. Thanks, Jane. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes question time this evening. Uh, thank you again to the submitters of the questions this evening and to councillors and the officers. Uh, petitions and joint letters. Uh, tonight, Councillor Nelson, you, do you... Is it possible to have a question? No, the question time is finished. Thank you. Councillor Nelson, have you a submission? Uh, I do. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I have a petition from... Uh, residents at Armstrong Green Village, uh, and they are the petition is to request uh, the establishment of a rear gate on Eagle Bay Road in Armstrong Creek, um, and that petition comes from uh, John Hendrick Strasser. Is that right, John? Great. Um, and that is, I think there's around a hundred submissions of the petition. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Nelson, accept that petition. Now there's another petition. Uh, I believe Daniel Senior might have that. Thanks, Daniel. Do you want to just yeah. speak on it? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Mayor and Councillors. Um, I'm here representing a proactive local community group who are petitioning to have the historic Barn River precinct adjacent to the Queen's Park golf course and between the Barn River and Montpellier Basins renamed as Queen's Park. Um, there are approximately 670 properties inside the proposed boundary, and to date we've got in excess of 630 signatures uh, supporting the petition. The area has been referred to as Queen's Park for in excess of 40 years, and was in fact the original name of the area dating back to original planning documentation in the 1840s, uh, prior to it being subdivided and then sold to private ownership. The goal of our uh, group is to formalise a community that already exists, uh, and to create an identity for the residents and for visitors to the area, and to gain more control over our rates dollars going into the area where we live, and that includes things like maintenance of roads, local parks and the riverfront. We're asking Council's endorsement of the proposal and to assist us in shepherding the name change through relevant authorities. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. You've got the petition there. Yeah. Councillor Nelson will take that from you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, so section two reports. First item is the Youth Council third report. I'd like to introduce the Deputy Youth Mayor, uh, Angel Mackay. Thanks, Angel. Come forward. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, Youth Council would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands, waterways and skies, the watering people, and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging, as well as acknowledging all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present and watching this evening. Good evening, Mayor Marahi, Greater Geelong Councillors and Directors, Geelong Youth Council representatives and community members here tonight. We are looking forward to hearing Councillors' thoughts on the report provided tonight. And, a, and continuing our discussions with councillors in our final Councillor Connect mentoring program session. 
Our focus of this report is to progress the work for the youth dedicated space for Central Geelong. We would first like to share how thrilled we have been to be actively involved in the Youth Hub's feasibility study and the co-design process of a central youth space. Throughout this process, past and current youth council members have identified and discussed the importance of having a safe and accessible youth space. But more importantly, we have heard how significant this is, not just to other young people in our community, but have been overwhelmed with how much support and interest we have received from multiple youth services and organizations in the Geelong region who believe as much as we do in this crucial work. We believe that this is the perfect time, whilst interest and commitment is high, for Council to act in the best interests of its youth community. We appreciate the difficult financial balancing act Council has to manage, but urge Council to focus less on the financial cost of establishing a hub, and focus more on the imperative social and human costs of not falling through with this work. Our advice to Council is to fund um, the establishment of a pilot to design and test the youth hub model to engage enable young people to access the supports and social spaces we need while demonstrating the model's effectiveness and benefits of our communities. We're excited to hear Council has several spaces to consider and we encourage Council to progress these works whilst there are spaces available and the interest is high within the community. Secondly, we request the city increase its intensity and frequency of advocacy advocacy work with state and federal government for additional funding to progress the project as described in the Youth Hub Feasibility Study. With a state election looming and no stadiums to fund this time around, now may be the best time to advocate for the Central Youth Hub. We would like to share our excitement about the progress Council has made so far and the recommendations put forward in the Youth Hub Feasibility Study. Additionally, we would like to thank everyone involved in developing this document and thank councillors for listening, discussing and considering our feedback. And we look forward to hearing from councillors about the actions the city plans to take to create supportive, safe and enabling environments for its young people. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Angel. Now, I need a mover and a seconder for this report. So moved Councillor Nelson and seconded Councillor Mason. Who did I say? Nelson. Councillor, seconded Councillor Harwood. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mayor Murray, <coughs> and thank you, uh, Deputy Junior Mayor Angel, for your excellent uh, presentation, but also for the report that's been produced by you and, and your fellow junior councillors. Um, it really is an excellent third report uh, on the extensive work that you've been doing, and uh, I really applaud that work. It's really been very eff effective with your three-pronged approach, um, meeting monthly, consulting broadly throughout the community with young people, and mentoring with counsellors. And I really applaud the diligence and uh, attention to current affairs, and thank uh, the COG staff as, as well for all of the work that they've done in, in uh, their professional guidance. And uh, it's particularly interesting that you've been so involved in current affairs. And so uh, I think you've set a really high standard uh, for us in this community, but also actually it's known throughout the country that you've been setting uh, this high standard. And uh, we're very proud of you and that you've maintained our vision uh, of a clever and creative community. So uh, I thank you uh, again and will uh, take heed uh, and give serious consideration to your advice regarding the interim youth hub in central Geelong and we understand it is really very important to young people. I'm also pleased that uh, you've been involved uh, through your, in, over the recent times in a briefing on climate action on the bike park in Ocean Grove uh, uh, with the COG Aboriginal Affairs Senior Policy Officer about January 26th and many other things. So, um, including two workshops uh, where you visited four locations regarding the co-design of the Youth Hub. So, well done and thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Mason. Your support means a lot. Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, thank you, Angel, for the uh, report this evening. And, uh, 
thank you to our other youth councillors who've come along this evening and um, had a glimpse of, uh, I guess, question time and uh, some of the things that we, we deal with uh, on a fairly day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think importantly, and I'll be very succinct, um, I think some of the key messages we've had coming out of, of the council group really do around the, uh, the health and wellbeing aspect, um, you know, a, a designated youth space within the CBD area um, is where our focus will go. And um, again, uh, we do um, respect and uh, appreciate the work done by the Youth Council. It does bring a fresh uh, view on occasions. There's no doubt about that. And uh, keep up the good work and we look forward to, um, to what the future may bring. But we hear you about what you're requiring. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Any other councillor wish to speak on this? Um, I'll just um, say that uh, we actually, the Bramble Ward had our mentoring uh, session Sunday last night, wasn't it? And uh, they're always, you know, a great hour. Um, you, you find the time to do it. And uh, the, the things that you discuss um, are relevant to what the, the senior council members and what the decisions we do make. Uh, so we do acknowledge the work that you do and the report that you've made. And uh, it never ceases to astound me. Um, the youth of today is who we should really be listening to most of the time, son. Anyway. Um, You're doing a good job of listening uh, to us so you. far. <laughs> and to, for you to, to come up here and, and read that report, um, very impressive. So keep up the good work, all the youth council. Uh, thank you so much, Mr Mayor. And thank you for the opportunity to do this as well. Like, uh, it's very meaningful. Pleasure's all ours. Councillor Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I just wanted to bring up, I'm not sure if the youth councillors are aware, but during a, a, one of the discussions, I um, floated the, the two arguments um, about your spaces in the loft area of the old Guff building. Um, for those of you who don't know that, we're, we're building a, um, a laneway through project, but the, the, um, the loft space is still available. So I, I reckon that would be a great space for, um, for the student council or for, for for, for young people in general, and also engaging with Deakin University. They've got a lot of spaces that aren't used at night. Um, they've got a lot of spaces that aren't used at night, and what better place to be um, than university for, um, for young and up-and-coming people of Geelong? I think it's a great space. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Nelson. Any other councillor? Otherwise, back to you, Councillor Mason, to close. Uh, thank you, Mayor Murray. And yes, I, I agree with you that uh, we always have scintillating discussions uh, at our mentoring sessions and uh, with, uh, with the Ballerine councillors, with Finn, Indy and Timothy. And uh, we always have something interesting to talk about. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we did, there were more things that we were aware of that you've been doing. And there was one thing that I was very pleased to attend the uh, Racism Raw and Real Forum and to find quite a number of our youth councillors there. So I, I uh, commend uh, the recommendation and thank you for your report. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Mason. I push this uh, report to the vote. All in favour? Against? That is carried. Thank you. Thanks, Angel. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Give her a clap. Thank you. Item number two is the Height and Village Urban Design Framework. Uh, moved by Councillor Harwood and seconded Councillor Maloney. Uh, Councillor Nelson. Uh, Mr Mayor, I've got an amendment. Um, please, I'd like to uh, add to the... Alternate the motion. Table, uh, the alternate, sorry. Yep. Sorry, Mr Mayor. So you're moving that, please? Um, it the sec seconder for the uh, alternative motion, Councillor Grisbeck. Councillor Nelson. Thank, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'll just read this out just quickly, just so that people can understand, because um, you probably you obviously haven't seen this. So uh, my alternate motion is that um, A, uh, that one, uh, that Council adopt the, the height and UDF subject to the following changes, and they are listed up there. Uh, it is a maximum preferred building height of nine metres on Bellevue Avenue to protect the character of height and village. Now, what that is, is it, that's the rough, roughly the height um, of the Bon Appetit building, if, you all, if everyone knows that. Um, so that would be the limit in the, in the village. 
Uh, number two, to retain the roundabout at Bellevue Avenue. Number three, to retain the, the clock tower. Number four, to retain access to the service road from Bellevue Avenue and Barrable Road. And number five, no, no net loss of car parking within the village um, or additional crossings, additional pedestrian crossings. Thank you. Uh, also, I'm not done. Also, um, note the significant community benefit that will come from the recommendations, uh, obviously, uh, in the urban design frame, framework, which includes a master plan for street, streetscape upgrades for Bellevue Avenue and Bellevue Arcade, design guidelines to protect the village char character from inappropriate development by including these building height controls where none exist now, um, retention of the library and an additional uh, or and a right hand turn lane on Barrable Road heading eastbound into Bellevue Avenue. And the last one is to spend the 2022-2023 budget allocation of $606,000 on paving and laneway upgrades as soon as practically possible. <clears throat> I know it's a lot to take in, but just have a read, just have a read of that while, while we discuss it. Um, Councillor Nelson. Okay, so by way of background, um, by way of background, um, let me take you on a little bit of a, of a story of, of um, our journey so far. In 2016, um, some of the residents that are here, uh, actually I just wanted to thank all the, all the small business owners that have turned up. Um, and the residents uh, that have turned up as well. Uh, as you'll probably remember, in 2016, residents and I um, fought the state government appointed administrators to save Heighton Library, which was, a, which was going to be closed, um, along with two others, one in Chilwell and one in Barwon Heads. And not only did we save those libraries, um, we've opened, since I've been on council from 2017 on, we've actually opened or built three more libraries. Um, which, which is a great testament of what, of what this council is trying to do, um, and we really understand and value the importance of libraries. Um, in 2016, I met with residents up at the Height and Bowls Club to work on this UDF, um, and back then we've, it's, it's gone through several um, times to council about how people think about Height and Village, and it's clear that residents love the look and feel of the village, and that's why we live there. Um, I'm a Height resident myself, um, as you all know. Um, it's quirky, the roundabout's a little funny, but it works, you know. Everyone that, that knows the area knows how to use it. If you don't know, how to, don't know how to use it, you just go slow anyway, and it just works. Um, if you want to drop in at Harvey's, the car parks are big out the front, you're in and out in a few minutes. However, if you want to stay longer, you can park out the back next to um, the bottle shop, next to Nardi's, or out the back of Gusto, and you can stay there for longer. And, and that's what people do in Heighton Village, because that's the way it is. Um, what is proposed, however, is something completely different. The strategy, the retail strategy, tells us we need an extra 1,000 square metres of retail space. And this can easily achieve, be achieved without building four-storey buildings, or multi-storey car parks, or residential buildings, or office space. In moving this alternate, I'm doing this because I love the village feel, the trees, the cafes, the restaurants, um, all, everything that that village has to offer. Um, and what sort of retail would be in a four-storey building, I just, I just don't get it. Um, we don't like the fact that it's run down. Previous council, including myself and Councillor Harwood, um, campaigned heavily for funding improvements and we've got the money there. Um, these are long overdue and that's why I've included them in, in this alternative. I'm sick of seeing people trip on unsafe paving. We also want an upgrade and a spruce up of the village. What we don't want is overdevelopment that has occurred in and around the village. Taylor Court, for example, has nine townhouses that were rejected by this council, yet they were subsequently approved by the state government appointed VCAT. The three-storey townhouses that are across the road on, Bel on Barrowal Road, again, weren't approved by this co these council laws. They were approved by state government appointed administrators. The right hand turn lane that I've been requesting for over three years has been rejected by the Department of Transport, again, the state government body, 
and they're saying it's not a priority. Well, it is a priority. It's dangerous. It is deadly. I use it every single day and watch cars dive in that inside lane, which is not made for cars. So we need to fix that and we need to fix it now. And it's time we fix what's broken and beautify what's not. Because I love the village and I'm sure everyone here does too. If you want big box shopping and there's nothing wrong with big box shopping, like Kmart or Target or Cotton On, go to Warm Ponds. That's fine. Um, and I'll leave it there for my fellow councillors to, uh, to speak on this further. Mr Mayor, thanks. Councillor Grisbeck. Um, Mr Mayor, I might just reserve my right, Mr Mayor, if that's OK. Yes. Sorry. Any other councillor wish to speak on this? Councillor Harwood. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, thank you to those that have attended tonight and um, given us their, uh, their view of the world and their view of um, uh, the height and chopping uh, precinct down there. Um, this has been a protracted discussion, to say the least, um, and there's good and bad reason for that. I guess the, probably the good reason is, is to constantly try and find an outcome that is going to meet the demands of the future and also meet the demands of the present and meet, the, meet the, even the, the demands of the, of the past, of what, um, what the actual village means to so many people. Um, I, I, just a little bit of devil's advocate, um, uh, insofar as if we're not able to at least somehow accommodate some extra services within the existing footprint, um, we'll continue to see the creep of businesses such down Balba Road, down Bellevue, and in and around the area, and that will continue. So I guess that's, that's one of the downsides that we've seen in recent times. Um, we've seen residential houses um, uh, basically changed into commercial premises, and we've seen that, that will continue. Um, as we see the demand for people to live in our area, um, that's what's going to occur. Um, the, commercial, um, yeah, the commercial business creep, um, the, the proposal is over quite an extended period of time. The council does not want to see any business impacted in any way, shape or form by any works that may be done there. Sometimes that's impossible, especially if you're doing footpaths and road, road works. Of course, there's, um, there is uh, imposition there. Um, that has to be a, a part of the, uh, the solution sought to be, um, uh, to be completed. So I just say you have to think longer term in anything that may be done there. There's not going to be a quick fix done in, say, 12 months. This is a long-term view of how it might look. Um, the clock tower. I've, I've loved the discussion about the clock tower. I know it's no, it's no Big Ben, but it's very much loved. So I get that. So um, contrary to what people might think about how councillors have viewed this particular um, precinct, um, we, have, we have been agonising over this for some time, trying to get it right. But we've come to the conclusion there probably isn't an exact right outcome. There just has to be a compromise that makes the village work as it's designed to work and to be loved as it is loved today. So we'll see what the future brings. Thank you. Don't clap. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Howard. Any other councillor wish to speak on this? Councillor Aiken. Thank you very much, Mr Mayor, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, for those of you that actually heard me speak on this issue last time at our Lara meeting, um, it's very similar again from myself. That is that UDF is now a dirty word in Geelong. It's a dirty word in South Geelong. The community didn't like it. It's a dirty word in Highton, and the community's told us that again tonight. And it's a dirty word, certainly, in Packing Street, because they've actually attended the last four meetings and telling us that it is a dirty word. <laughs> what is our responsibility, then, as councillors? Well, we have to change what this word actually means. Our responsibility is to set the policy and framework for which we undertake um, our responsibilities as a councillor. At the moment, all these UDFs are, they're about planning. And we are saying, we're going to accept it because it's about planning. What I've actually heard tonight and previous nights is that unique is an extremely important word that we need to introduce into our definition of UDF. What UDF, UDF should not mean urban design framework. UDF should mean unique design for local communities. That's what our UDFs should actually do. Our UDFs should, should actually reflect what our local communities want. 
and our local communities our local communities have rejected the planning principle of it. I mean, what, what's fascinating is we're being told that it has to be planned to Australian um, um, standards. Well, the Arc de Triomphe is actually a roundabout and it doesn't meet Australian planning standards. The, the Trevi Fountain doesn't meet Australian um, standards. The, 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 the Queen's Victoria Memorial that sits outside the front of Buckingham Palace is actually a roundabout. It doesn't meet Australian design principles. We've actually got a community that said they love their roundabout, they love their clock tower, it is unique for us, it is symbolises our village that we have in the area in which we live. Why can't we keep it? Well, the... So our urban design framework shouldn't be that. What we should be developing is unique design for our local communities. And I encourage councillors, the best way you will be able to do that tonight is actually support the amendment that's been presented by Councillor Nelson because it reflects what the local community is actually asking us to do as councillors. And it actually is where people live. We're not actually talking about a new area. We're not talking about... Um, changing an industrial area or taking a sale yards and turning it into something else. This is actually a living and breathing community and they want to retain the villageness of that particular area. And unfortunately, the planning framework that we've been presented does not reflect what that local community desires, wishes or wants. And we have a responsibility to reflect that in the decision that we make as councillors tonight. Working. Might be a good reason for that. No, it's back on. Um, I've got to be careful what I say because um, I, I don't quite understand, and I say this with all respect to, to the people in the chamber here, the hysteria that's been created about the Heightened Shopping Centre, um, this UDF. See, I don't, I, don't, I don't mind the look of it. And I love Heightened Shopping Centre as much as anyone here used to live only 100 metres from Bellevue Avenue um, for four or five years. So, and I know, and I still go there, still go to the Heightened Shopping Centre because it's convenient, I love it, and it, it's a good feel about it. But it, I think it needs real, um, some sort of change to it. I think it needs some TLC, which we've all agreed to, and, and, and most people are nodding. See, I don't think this UDF is so over the top. I don't. And, uh, you know, the proposal of, of, of um, four storeys on one particular area of the whole height and shopping centre, to me, isn't exaggerated. I think that's respectful for the, the residents' wishes. And, and already... Thank you. I understand, I understand you've got different views, but already there's... With the old Commonwealth Bank site, it's already a three-storey three proposal there already. So what we're actually doing is if, if we don't agree with this, there's already, there's the, the height limits are going to be all over the place in, with those um, shops along Bellevue Avenue. And, and okay, so look, I understand, I'm just, I'm perhaps putting another view there because right, right from, from the, the day one on this, I thought it doesn't look too bad. And I understand um, Council Nelson's um, alternative motion, and you know I don't mind that. But the roundabout, I don't know. You know, if, you, if you're driving the first time and you get to, well, whatever you call it, a roundabout, you don't know where you're giving way. Who's got that give way sign? Is it you that should just be going? I I challenge every one of you. The first time you got to that roundabout, you would have been the same. And it's not until you go through that three or four times that you understand how the traffic works. It's just a point I make on that. And, and it's been changed. There's three independent traffic analysis is done on it, and, it, and that comes back. It needs change, this, the, the, whatever you call it, a roundabout. And it's about the future. It's not about tomorrow. It's about what the future. You know, 
long time down the track of what the Highton Village um, can look like. So, you know, there's, there's shops that are closing there now. There's, there's empty shops closing there now, so something has to happen. Thank you. Thanks very much. Any other councillor wish to comment on this? Uh, Councillor Grisbeck. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, uh, so I'm going to be supporting the amended uh, amendment tonight. I think what I wanted the community to understand is that um, we hear what you're saying. Uh, we read every email that we get. We listen to every question that comes into the chamber. Um, we, I read every petition. Um, we always watch social media. Well, I do anyway. Um, I think that uh, the the whilst you think that you know we might support or not support a particular item um, and you want us to hear that, I think what we're saying to you is that we do hear it and our decision-making framework is that we need to keep our opinions to ourselves before this particular night so that we cannot be conflicted in making a decision in the chamber. So um, whilst it might seem that we're not supportive or we are supportive, um, we can't express an opinion before tonight making a decision. So um, thank you for sharing your views. Uh, thank you for showing your passion for your community. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the, the councillors in that area, Councillor Nelson, Harwood and Maloney, because it's never easy when we're trying to do a, a particular uh, item like this. And I wish we could have this kind of passion for some other topics that we've got at council. So I implore you to continue to bring those uh, questions to council. Continue to, to have engagement with council because we could become a better council for when we engage well with the community. So uh, thank you, uh, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Uh, back to you, Councillor Nelson. Turned off. There we go. I just wanted to re reiterate what Councillor Grisbeck said. Um, it was a conversation I had um, with a local resident that w we can't we can't respond to your emails about how we feel about a um, a particular project such, such as this or a pack in the new DF or where, whatever the story is. So when you email us and, and ask us for our opinion, we can't give it until the meeting because otherwise we can't vote for it. Um, so I just need to make that point really clear. Um, like a rally, we can't turn up and go, yeah, I agree with you, or no, I disagree, because then we can't vote on it. So you really need to understand that point, and I can see a lot of nodding, so that's great that you, that you understand it. Um, certainly, with it comes back to the retail strategy that we all talk about, um, that we need 1,000 extra square metres of space. This will easily be, easily be achieved with my alternate recommendation, easily. Um, so that, that won't be an issue. Um, with regard to creep down on uh, Barrable Road and Roslyn Road, it's not retail creep. These are psychologists, they're osteopaths. Um, it's not retail. So um, I'm a little disappointed that, that that sort of stuff gets through council, but you've got to put them somewhere. So, but they are creating traffic problems and I do see it because I do use the road every day. Um, the reason that shop closed down at Darrell Farm was probably because of COVID. They had to hold a lot of stock. Um, it's not as if you're a, um, a fruit and veg shop where the stock turns over all the time. So I can understand why Darrell Farm had closed, but um, there will be two new shops there very, very soon. Yeah. Um, and the clock tower was actually put there by Keith Fagg, who was a, um, a previous mayor um, back in his um, Belmont Rotary days. So, um, go. Um, so this, this amendment uh, is what the state member says he wants. Um, he's not here, but I'm sure he's watching online. Uh, it's also what the state Liberal candidate says that he wants. Uh, it's what almost 5,000 people of uh, Highton <coughs> resident Graham Hobbs' petition uh, say they want. So I implore my fellow councillors to help me support my community. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Nelson. Thank you, Councillor Nelson. Uh, I put this alternative motion to the vote. All those in favour? 
All those against? That is carried. Thank you. Mr Mayor, can I, can I call the division, please? Yeah. Item, item number two is the Bluestone so, Cottage Mr. Relocation Mayor, Feasibility I Study. Asked for a division, so it's recorded the vote. Because you want a division on that, Councillor Aiken? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it was. Um, All those in favour? All those against? The Collingwood supporter. You don't have to stay if you don't want. Uh, item number three is the Bluestone Cottage Relocation Feasibility Study at uh, 375 Barwon Heads Road. Moved by Councillor Maloney and seconded Councillor Nelson. Councillor Maloney. Here we go. Thank you. This report... Is, oh, bye, yeah, everyone. Speak up. Uh, this report is recommending the Council note the findings of the independent feasibility study into the relocation of the Bluestone Cottage from the Barwon Heads Road. Uh, we know that the major roads, uh, Project Victoria last year, uh, dismantled this cottage in order to duplicate the Barwon Heads Road. And the city has listened to community feedback and worked with the Victorian government to try and appropriately dismantle and store the heritage cottage until its uh, later re relocation. The study has examined five options for the community to consider to relocate the cottage, including proposals from the Marshall Bluestone Cottage Community Group and MV, MRVP, P, PV, sorry. Uh, so the, the relocation costs, interpretation and reconstruction of the site is what was considered as part of the study. Uh, so uh, I'd like to um, open this uh, for uh, debate amongst councillors, but uh, primarily the, the study has gathered some significant and information, um, valuable information that will uh, help us to maintain the further in, you know, investigations into the cost, potential use, and the planning and design requirements of the cottage. Thank you, Mayor Murray. Thank you, Councillor Maloney. Uh, Councillor Nelson. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'll reserve my right, please. Any other councillor? Councillor Grisbeck. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'd just like to, to support um, this, this motion. I think um, what this has shown is that, um, you know, Hopefully uh, that we've seen that the council is listening to the community and whilst it was uh, intervention uh, into the state government's changes along that road, council has been supportive uh, of uh, all of the aspects of this along the way um, and, and intervened and negotiated with state, count, state government on this particular topic. So I think it's a good example of uh, where we can work together with the state I think it's a good example of um, community engagement and, and people uh, talking to us about what their preferred option is. I'm hoping um, for uh, a fantastic outcome and that we can uh, have a facility that, uh, whilst it might be quite small, a facility that will be able to be used by community members um, for which it was intended um, the reasons why we would invest in a, in a, in a, a option like this. But I think it's really incumbent on state government to assist. Uh, they were the ones that removed it. They should be the ones that support the funding of it going back. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Grisbeck. Any other council? Councillor Mason. Uh, thank you, Mayor Marahi. Um, I uh, have had some problems with this uh, um, proposal. Uh, and I'm disappointed in some ways that uh, option three doesn't include uh, some capacity for variation to consider some internal authenticity. But when it's all cut and dried, uh, I note clearly that option one has a safety problem. And it's, it's actually disappointing that the community groups didn't take more note of that because option three could have had 
uh, a greater uh, consideration perhaps to some, some internal authenticity. I note in the, in the, in the plans that there are um, internal walls provisions for, the, for a future uh, internal walls. And so perhaps there's some opportunity in the future uh, to, um, to accommodate um, some further internal authenticity in, the, um, in this building. But uh, I understand the safety issues and I uh, support the motion for option three. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Any other councillor? Otherwise, back to you, Councillor Maloney. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Councillor Nelson. Thank yes. you, Mr Mayor. Yeah, yep. I, um, I've been on this journey um, with the two ladies in the front there for, since it started, I think, from memory. It was, it was quite a few years ago. Um, and the, the main issue was that we didn't lose the cottage. Um, and that was the first thing we, we got over the line. And, and credit where credit's due to the state government, they've, they've come to the table and they've helped us out. Um, and we're going to keep the cottage, that's great. Um, but what, what disappoints me is that um, your, your views weren't, weren't heard. Um, they weren't part of the, of the matrix um, for option one. And it was said that it was um, too close to the roundabout, but um, the current city hall, or what, Ricky Nial over there, is, is very close to the road. Um, you know, a lot of buildings are close to roads. That doesn't make them unsafe. Um, so I, I can't vote for this because I think option one is a, is a better option. Um, but understand um, why council laws and council officers want option three. Um, yes, we're getting to keep the, the, um, the Bluestone College, and that's fantastic. Um, but it would have been better and more highly <coughs> visible for option, option one, um, because after all, this, this will hopefully be a, a tourist attraction and a, and a, a tourism point for people that going to the Ballerine uh, and beyond can stop and have a break um, and look at this, this beautiful piece of, of Geelong history, which, which um, certainly we're, we're losing all the time. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm disappointed that option one um, isn't going through, but, but happy that it's being retained. Um, and hope to, to the, that you two will work with council um, and the state government um, to make it the best possible thing it can be. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Nelson. Uh, Councillor Maloney. Thank you, Mr um, I just wanted to reiterate that this report recommends that Council notes the independent study findings. Uh, this is not a point where we decide um, what happens uh, and what goes ahead uh, as far as options. And we certainly haven't gotten funding from the state government. So if anyone from state government is, uh, is listening into this, it's probably a time for us to start uh, shaking, the, um, shaking the hat. Uh, and given that it's necessity, uh, the, the state government's necessity to remove this building, I would hope that they would be under uh, full cooperation as to whichever um, option that we decide to proceed when we do arrive at that conclusion. Uh, and, and that's not at this juncture at this point. Thank you. Councillor Maloney, put this matter to the vote. All those in favour? Against? That is carried. Item number four is the City of Greater Geelong Annual Report 2021-22 and the Annual Report Summary 2021-2022. Uh, moved Councillor Sullivan and seconded Councillor Asher. Councillor Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Mayor. Um, this report we have before us asked Council to note the City of Greater Geelong's Annual Report 2021-22 and the Annual Report Summary of 21-22. Now, the annual report provides a detailed overview of the organisation's performance during those said years, the financial year to be specific. It details our financial results as well as works carried out towards achieving our strategic priorities uh, during the first year of the Council's four-year Our Community Plan, which is from 21 to 25. Now, there's plenty of things going on this. I'm sure councillors will want to talk at length about their passion areas. Uh, but I'll just give a brief overview that this report is based on the 270-odd thousand estimated residents in the city. That includes 350,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We have a median age of 39 right now. 
and we have 17.7% .7 of our population is born overseas, and that is continuing to grow along with our population rate. Uh, we have over 19,000 businesses in our region, 3.6 million visitors, and 133 kilometres of coastline, combined with 1,335 hectares of protected natural habitat. Um, along with that, though, we are hitting some key markers in items, as I said, which are strategic directions that the Council's wanting to move in, such as our over 200,000 hits on our Have Your Say website. Uh, that is incredibly important across a myriad of projects, and continue, those numbers continue to rise. Uh, we have maintained over 165,000 streets and park trees, very passionate in certain areas on Geelong right now, but of course they are very important across the entire municipality. Uh, over 95,000 home care services were provided by the city. The city is actually one of the largest aged care services uh, providers in our region that often goes overlooked. We opened up 30 new public open space reserves. Uh, 50 items were added to the Geelong Treasures. Well, Geelong Treasures were added to the Geelong Heritage Collection. 47 filming permits were issued, which is interesting as well, given the rise of the arts and cultural. Uh, sectors were coming out of COVID lockdowns and whatnot. Um, over 8,000 enrolments in the swim school, that's another little fun fact, uh, along with growth, growing birth rates, uh, to have participation in swimming uh, education is incredibly important uh, for safety. And over 100 CCTV cameras maintained, uh, that is a number, of course, we are advocating as well with state government as how we can best ensure community safety. Um, so that's just a quick snapshot. I'll leave it to other councillors and I'll wrap up at the end. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Sullivan. Councillor Asher. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and that's a fantastic summary there. Some fun facts from the Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Sullivan. There's um, some really good sustainability facts in here too that I wouldn't mind sharing. During 2021 to 2022, we had a 29% drop in the organisation's carbon emissions, um, which was driven by the switch to renewables, which is fantastic. We've had a really good effort from recycled materials as well in road reconstruction projects. And of course, the street light upgrade program has been progressing really well too. So all of those initiatives, among others, saw us earn the Keep Victoria Beautiful 2021 Sustainability Sustainable City Award. And we're keeping our fingers crossed at the moment because we're a finalist for the same awards for 2022. So hopefully we can do a back-to-back. -back. Um, on the same topic of sustainability, we can really show that the organisation is working very hard to ensure that all members of our community are cared for and considered. We've endorsed, uh, been endorsed by the Reconciliation Australia of Council's first reconcil reconciliation action plan. Excuse me. Um, we've done our arts and culture strategy from 2021 to 2031 and a positive ageing strategy as well, right through to 2047. So the annual report as the Deputy Mayor has pointed out, provides a snapshot of a whole lot of the work done by the staff throughout the year on a day-to-day -day basis, and it also includes 12.1 million curbside bin collections. We've replaced 14.3 kilometres of footpaths, processed 44,519 dog and cat registrations, and received 1,726 planning permit applications, keeping the team busy. So lots of fantastic facts. Um, the reports don't sort of occur by themselves and magically appear, so I commend the team on all the work that's been done to put this piece of um, work together and deliver all the work in it as well. So um, there's a lot of financial information that I'm sure my colleagues will uh, like to share, particularly our finance chair over there, so I'll stop now and maybe let someone else take over. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Asher. Any other councillor? Councillor Grisby. Thank you, Mr Mayor. thought I'd just uh, take a quick moment to um, highlight a couple of other things that I saw in the report that I'm really proud of. And, um, you know, in an effort to reduce the household waste, there is a trial, a food waste trial going on in little old Lara. Uh, and it's intended that this service will be rolled out uh, region-wide, hopefully, in the coming years. Um, uh, both Councillor Aiken and Ira, and I'm sure the whole council, are really proud that the Northern Aquatic and Community Hub has started, and you can see this development on the corner of Cox Road and the Princess Highway. Um, and we've got little peepholes that you can look in and actually see the construction going on. And pe the community is so involved and really want to see uh, how that's going. It's $61.1 million, um, and it's going to be absolutely amazing facility uh, when it's finished. 
Um, the other one was from a, an economic point, uh, our immediate focus was really on uh, targeted support during COVID-19 restrictions and we can't wash that under the carpet. I think we've got to remember that that happened in the last financial year um, and I know we want to look forward um, but, but that was uh, one of the biggest things that we were able to do as a council is how do we support our local communities and businesses um, through, that, through that time. Um, and also, to thanks to the former Mayor, Stephanie Asher, for your leadership during that particular time. So, thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Grisbeck. Any other councillor? No. Uh, back to you, Councillor Sullivan. Just offered to eat me words there. I said everybody would be keen to talk about their passionate areas. Um, no, thank you very much, everybody who spoke on this uh, topic. Uh, this, there is, I encourage everybody walk, looking, watching, is what I'm looking for, from home, um, because this is a whole report. Uh, there's a lot of good information at this. We can't digest it all, sort of speak it all out in one meeting. Um, the financial figures uh, reflect the natural current economic climate that we are in, um, and, but the updates on the projects and sort of the, the outlines of our street key strategic priority areas um, is something that we should all be familiar with in Geelong, so I'm definitely happy to talk to people about that. Um, but it is a, a proper summary of where we're at, and it's a, it's a good report, and I'm happy to move the motion. Thank you, Councillor Sullivan. Put it to the vote. All in favour? Against? That is carried. Thank you. Item number five is the Myers Reserve Master Plan, uh, moved by Councillor Grisbeck and seconded Councillor Aiken. Councillor Grisbeck. Thank you, Mayor Marahi. Uh, I'd like to ask councillors to support uh, the Myers Reserve Master Plan as a draft plan, and it is uh, open to the consultation to the community and the broader community for six weeks. Um, this report uh, has uh, a draft master plan for the, the uh, whole precinct in Myers Reserve. Um, this uh, project reference group uh, and stakeholder and user groups were established to in provide input into the uh, development of this plan. Um, and it also considers Myers Reserve and it sits within the context of the Northern Western growth area and the future development uh, that sits uh, in that northern part of Geelong. This is, uh, as I said, a public release of the draft plan and uh, what I'm asking community members and all of the stakeholders within that plan is to feed us back your thoughts on this plan. Um, please uh, go through the formal process. There will be a have your say uh, period for six weeks and, and I'm sure we're open to councillors and council officers as to getting emails from the community because I, I understand there's some pretty passionate people uh, that use Myers Reserve, as would every other reserve in, in, in the city of Greater Geelong, but um, there's some pretty passionate people here as well and I'd love to hear what they think of this particular report. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Grisby. Councillor Aiken. Thank you very much, Mr Mayor. Um, look, endorse the words that uh, what Councillor Grisbeck has told us tonight, but um, I was just specifically talk about the soccer club. Um, look, this draft plan is actually, they're a major stakeholder in it, and they don't actually support the master plan. And um, this process here will be um, a clear opportunity for that major stakeholder to actually present to us why they don't support um, the officer um, presented master plan. Primarily to educate the council um, group on that is that there are, the soccer club prefers to have a pavilion that actually can access the, new, um, the soccer fields um, in a far superior site to what the existing pavilion is. They have been told that mature, mature tree protection means that um, they cannot have the pavilion in the preferred site. So it's actually ultimately will be the decision of this council group um, about um, our mature tree policy that we do have. Um, my understanding is that the mature trees are not native. They actually have been, um, they're, they're not indigenous to the, to the local area. They are mature because they were planted quite a long time ago. And um, the soccer club will present to, I believe, in, during this particular process, a very strong argument why the council does need to consider that the plan that actually has been um, presented should be rejected and actually isn't um, 
the, the correct site location for a pavilion for the future and for maximum community benefit um, in that precinct. So it is appropriate we um, endorse the consultation on this plan, but I flag that um, there will be strong representation made to the council group that it's not supported by the stakeholders. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Aiken. Any other councillor wish to comment on this? Uh, uh, councillor Nelson. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. As a as a an ageing, um, washed up cricketer, I've been to Myers Reserve many, 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 many times playing on the dust bowl out the back. Um, cricket and, and I understand that um, the community should have their say and, and really get involved because as we've seen when the community get involved um, good things happen so um, please have your say is, is what I want to say to um, the people out there and not just um, the people that um, are the soccer club, the cricket club, football club, everybody out there, netball club need to, to have their say to make sure that they get the best possible services they can get. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Nelson. Um, I'll, I'll just um, comment on it as well. Um, there's the Moa Reserve, and the next matter on the on the is the Hamlin Park uh, Reserve Master Plans and the Draft Plans. So they'd both go out for for consultation. Um, I was up at Myers Reserve with Councillor Grisbeck. Was that last week? And uh, and Councillor Aiken spoke about uh, the trees, and it's an interesting. Um, issue that uh, we spoke about that um, it would be a great opportunity for the councillors to have a presentation by the officers in relation to the tree, uh, what do you call it, um, strategy. And you know, we talk about offsets, what does that exactly mean? And you talk about costs if trees are removed, what does that actually mean? Who pays those costs? Who to? And how is uh, that amount um, written, you know, got to? in relation to if you pull trees out. Um, so this is an interesting, it will we'll come back and it'll be interesting and um, I mean any master plan uh, for any community um, sporting groups has, uh, has got, I imagine, full support. Um, so six weeks, public consultation, any of those stakeholders and, and any, any other persons interested in the Myers Reserve, please have your say. And um, it's, uh, it looks pretty good apart from that one issue. So any other council? Back to you, Councillor Grisbeck. Thank you, Mr Mayor. And just to close, um, what, what we've got here is, you know, the, the report has determined there are some, some major issues that need to be fixed up. It is an old and tired facility. But what I want the community to understand is that if we get this master planning right, so we get the feedback, we, we do whatever decision we make in the future, this is actually going to be a facility for future residents that are going to uh, live in that precinct. So it's not just for, for the, the current tenants of the park to have their say, but you know, lots of other people are going to call this place home uh, in the future. And what we want to see is that we want to get this master planning process right because there, is, there will be, at some point, some developer contributions that could come to this particular reserve as part of the uh, development of the northern western growth area. So uh, it's particularly important that we get the plan right because then all funding decisions and decisions um, out as to what we do and how we stage those improvements um, will be made from this particular master plan. So this is not just a master plan that we're going to get and shove in the bottom drawer. This is important that we need to make sure uh, we get it right so that it can be funded and can be changed. That's all. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Grisbeck. Uh, put this to the vote. All in favour? Against? That is carried. Thank you. Item number six is the Hamlin Park Recreation Reserve Master Plan, draft plan. Uh, I'm moving that matter and it's seconded by Councillor Nelson. Um, so as per the last um, item, uh, Hamlin Park recommends the Council endorse the release of the draft Hamlin Park uh, Recreation Reserve Master Plan uh, for the purpose of broader uh, community consultation for six weeks. There's been several stages of master planning processes are now complete, including a site and needs analysis issues and opportunities report and initial community engagement which resulted in the development of this plan. The, uh, this included all current tenants of the reserve 
and other key stakeholders, including the Bell Park Sport and Recreation Club, um, the Hamlin Park Tennis Club. Uh, Geelong's best kept secret is the Geelong Ballroom Dance Club. If you haven't been there, it's worth a visit. And the Scouts Victoria and the Western Heights College, which is a very advanced uh, sporting program. And of course, they see the opportunity for expansion in this, uh, this reserve. So um, several priorities have been identified, including the development of compliant, fit for purpose change rooms to support netball participation. I've uh, certainly been there supporting uh, daughters play uh, netball at Bell Park and uh, you're out in the weather and no protection at all. Um, but uh, it doesn't stop the participation, a refurbish refurbishment of existing sporting facilities and the Geelong Ballroom Dance Club building to make facilities compliant. And uh, the district level play space, protection, enhancement of the natural environment and improved pedestrian safety and linkages through the reserve and as I've said about this, supporting the Western Heights College initiatives where they have big uh, ambitions and big plans for the future there. So um, just going out to when I arrived in Geelong in 1980, that was my first game of football at Bell Park and there. Um, and it's, um, it's still a great ground and a great club and great people. So uh, it needs to be upgraded. And Mr Mayor? I did kick five. <laughs> <laughs> That wasn't a Dorothy Dixer either. The, uh, to you, Councillor Nelson. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, just wanted to say what I said before about um, the previous reserve. Um, the community needs to have their say, and I'm sure they will, because um, as councillors are aware, um, we need to have as many multi-use facilities as we, as we possibly can, um, because that way they get the, the maximum benefit out of the out of the spaces. Um, and this is, got, as um, the Mayor said, uh, this place has got everything. And yes, I have been to the, the ballroom dancing. I, I think I participated a little bit, bit of it once for a, a photo opportunity. Um, it was pretty embarrassing, because um, <laughs> my dancing days consisted at the Geelong Italian Social Club um, back, in the, back in the mid 80s. Um, so please uh, have your say um, for this six week period. Um, and, and then we will know what the community really feels about that area. I was there the last time I was there when we announced the lights there. Yeah. Uh, it was a freezing cold night, but um, great facility. Uh, and please make sure that you have your say. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Grisbeck. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I think one of the things that I wanted to note on this is that the master, there was a previous master plan and it was uh, prepared for the site in 2010. And so what that probably tells us is that, um, you know, these master plans need to have a revision date um, and, and looked at that if, if they're still fit for purpose. You know, that's 12 years ago. Um, by the time we implement this, maybe 13. And so um, that tells me that we need to continually refresh these master plans uh, for the current environment by which this community um, is doing. And it also tells me that Councillor Nelson will do anything for a photo opportunity, including ballroom dancing. Thank you. Any other councillor? I don't know, back to me, no. So, uh, look, there's nothing further to add on this. It goes out for public consultation, so I urge all those uh, with some interest in the Hamlin Park Recreation Reserve to have their say. I put it to the vote. All those in favour? Against, that is carried. Thank you. Item number seven is the South East Ballerine Coast. Yes, sir. You got the dragon on? Yeah. Imagine it starts right from tonight. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> thanks for coming along. I didn't realise you were sitting there, so with the Bell Park gear on. <laughs> Thank you. Good Thank on you. you. Thank you. <laughs> was I? Item number seven, South East Ballerine Coast 4W Colandina Coastal and Marine Management Plan 2022 to 2032. Uh, Councillor Mason moving and Councillor Asher second. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mayor Marahi, and it appears uh, 
there isn't much of a gallery here now, so the community's already had its say, I'd say. But this is uh, an exciting plan and it covers the coastal dune system, Crown land managed by COG between Fellows Road, uh, which is 4W, and Colindina or Bonivar Road and 600 metres out to sea. This is one of the last areas of continual biodiversity in the region. The South East Bellarine Bean Coast um, Coastal Marine Management Plan 2022 to 2032 is really an important piece in the Bellarine environmental fabric. It will later be complemented by the precinct South East Bellarine Biolink Master Plan and the upgraded COG uh, Biodiversity Strategy and the COG Plan for Nature and of course our recently announced uh, distinctive areas and landscapes. And at a landscape scale, the BioLink Master Plan combines terrestrial, mm -hmm. wetland, coastland and marine environments. It'll make one of the largest um, and most important places for bio biodiversity remaining uh, on the Bellarine Peninsula. So this management plan has also considered the adjacent Lonsdale Lake Wildlife Reserve, Moona Woodland and adjoining foreshore areas <coughs> uh, which form important connectivity and landsca landscape scale biolink. The coastal reserve is inaccessible by public roadway with pedestrian access only at the urban edges. The reserve size is about 119 hectares and remoteness make it particularly significant for conservation and it's not subject <coughs> to the same pressures as other more accessible coastal reserves. It, as I've already said, is an important biolink and provides habitat for many plants and animals and state and national significance, including the endangered hooded plover. There's been a wide range of stakeholders, 25 organisations participated. Uh, there's a comprehensive project steering group, including Wadawurrung, Borough of Queenscliff, uh, Bellarine Catch, um, uh, CCMA, DELP, Parks Victoria, a community reference group and adjacent <coughs> landholders and others. And of course, as I just said, the community has had its say over a 30 day period. Uh, there were 28 submissions. Um, and I'll leave it to uh, other councillors to make their contributions. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Councillor Asher. Thank you, Mr Mayor. It seems years ago, because it actually was years ago, um, that we all got together at the Shell Road footy facility to discuss the best way forward for this incredible area. And that conversation was driven by some really passionate locals, uh, notably Noel Emsel, who's a life member of the Ocean Grove Surf Life Saving Club and metaphorically a part of the furniture um, on our coastline. And there were so many people there that day who wanted a safe path connection from Point Lonnie to Ocean Grove, and just as many people, lots of us the same people, who wanted to passionately protect the natural environment and all of its diversity there. And that was an incredibly well facilitated session, uh, given the diversity of stakeholders, the passion of those stakeholders. It was extremely professional. I think the fact that this has grown into this particular management plan now I think it started well, it's continued well, and it's just got better and better. So credit to everybody involved. I'm very happy to endorse this plan. It's terrific. Thank you, Councillor Asher. Any other councillor? No? Back to you, Councillor Mason. Uh, not a lot more to add, uh, except it was a really excellent uh, community engagement at, at, as it began at Shell Road those years ago, as Councillor Asher mentioned. Uh, it's interesting that it's also called for collaboration from the Wadarung traditional owners and uh, let's make their country good together, 2020 to 2030. Uh, their document, Paliat Jaraja, uh, has contributed to this. Uh, and so there will be strong focus on uh, protecting and enhancing biodiversity values and threatened ecological communities protecting the hooded plover, eradicating woody weeds and reducing high threat herbaceous weeds, reducing the threats po pe posed by pest animals, including rabbits and foxes, understanding and preparing for climate change impacts and providing better community access to natural areas, uh, increasing residents' connection to the local environment. Uh, there will be, um, it will be funded uh, generally by the city 
And uh, we have grant opportunities such as the June Care Grant, the recent June Care Grant of 270k. So uh, I congratulate all involved as well. It's been an excellent uh, initiative and uh, endorse the uh, recommendation. Uh, thank you, Councillor Mason. I'll put this to the vote. All in favour? Against? That is carried. Item number eight is the proposed amendment C443 double double E and planning permit uh, number 750 2022, uh, four to eight Sparan Avenue, Nor Lane, Nor Lane Community Initiatives. Moved by Councillor Aiken and seconded Councillor Grisbeck. Councillor Aiken. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Look, this is actually quite a unique one that's coming before us tonight. Um, Norlane Community Initiatives is a, an organisation that invests in the potential of local neighbourhoods. Um, they believe that community should um, be supported to develop local ideas and envision in their local community. And they actually believe the local community should deliver those projects. So in other words, this is actually a, a sort of an organisation that's creating quite a bit of reform out in the Norlane area, because it's actually saying the only people that are really going to be able to help Norlane are the people that live there themselves. And I must congratulate our planning department because they've embraced that principle as well too. Because what um, Norlane Community Initiative, some of the projects they do do, they've, they've got a Monday night um, food security um, where over 200 local residents come and actually get fed, but they have to actually cook the food themselves, they have to clean the dishes. It's not a traditional um, volunteer model where people who want to do good come into the community. The community actually does it. Um, they also have an initiative called Farm Next Door where there's a residential block that's been turned into um, um, a local farm which produces um, food for the local community. And they're very big on food and nutrition is something that's going to change the health issues and also the aspirations of that local community in Norlane. Because sadly, that community actually believes fast food is nutrition. And, that's, um, and our planning team has actually recognised this in the support um, that they're bringing before us tonight. Because what, what's happened is Norlane Community Initiative's um, original site location was a Baptist church in Spawn Avenue in, in Norlane. They had a vision to actually build a community hub at that particular site location, but our planning scheme actually stopped them from doing it. Our planning scheme said, no, you couldn't have a place of worship. No, if you do have a place that the community uses, you have to actually have this many car parks. No, you can't do it. But What's really encouraging is our planning team have actually recognised that, well, hang on, this is actually a really important um, project for that community. And what we should be doing at Council is changing our planning scheme and actually change, uh, giving an opportunity for a planning permit that can be issued for this particular site. This is exactly what's being presented before us tonight. And I'm really proud of what our planning team has actually put forward um, to us, the council tonight. And it does set a precedent, I believe, for a change of cultural attitude in our planning department. Kylie and I are now facing a another issue in our community in that the, the NASH, we are being told the water world um, will be demolished and closed and shut for six months before the new facility can be opened. That's six months without a aquatic or recreation facility in that community to meet planning permit requirements. What I hope is if the council endorses this tonight, that it actually sets a precedent for our planning department to actually say, well, hang on, this council group has endorsed us to be clever and creative with our responsibilities in planning. Let's come up with solutions which are for the greater benefit and the greater good of our public. And this is a very small example of that, but I hope it actually sets <coughs> a floodgates of thinking in that regard, because Kylie and I will need the council support to either amend a planning permit or to change our planning regulations so that we don't have a closure for six months of a facility, because ultimately we're being told that we have to meet our occupancy requirements associated with car parking. So, why aren't we actually addressing that issue instead of coming up with solutions that suggest that a facility needs to be closed for six months in tenor? So 
I commend what our planning team has presented to us. I encourage the councillors to have a look at what Norland Community Initiatives is actually doing in the Norland community. And this is a very significant step forward to continue that community's work. And um, I'm very proud of what our officers have presented to us tonight. Thank you, Councillor Aiken. Uh, Councillor Grisbeck. Uh, that's it. I, it's really hard to follow Councillor Aiken um, because he does such a good job in explaining the report. And I think I'd just say um, well done to the team at Norland Community Issues and the planning team at the city. Um, this is, in, as Councillor Aiken has said, an example of how we can work together. Um, it's in a real um, opportunity to, to set the bar high uh, for how we work with community groups. Um, you know, if you're not already following Norlane Community Initiatives on social media, please do so. Some of them, are, uh, or go out and visit them. Um, some of the amazing stuff that's happening out there is actually driven by community itself. Um, and this is not a top-down model. This is a bottom-up model. Um, and it, it seems to be really working out there. So um, that probably will do. Mr Mayor, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Grisbeck. Any other councillor? No? Councillor Aiken? Nothing further to add, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Put it to the vote. All those in favour? Against, that is carried. Number nine is the proposed lease to Amped Littell, uh, Telstra, part of Heighton Reserve, 95 to 105 Barrable Road, Heighton. Moved uh, Councillor Harwood and seconded Councillor Maloney. Councillor Harwood. Uh, Mr Mayor, um, this is basically uh, seeking uh, community consultation about a proposal for the city to uh, lease an area of the Heighton Reserve, which we, where we currently um, have a mobile tower infrastructure. Um, and uh, we're looking to increase the size of the tower to increase the uh, Telstra coverage in the area, which is the uh, premise of the, um, of the item. Currently, uh, uh, it's at 20 metres, I want to go to 30 metres. Um, and also increase um, capacity with uh, <coughs> Vodafone and there's one other um, telecommunication provider to also operate off the pole. So uh, I'll leave it at that, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Maloney. Thanks, Mayor Marahi. Um, I'd like to cite that for, uh, I guess, in the process of the community consultation, that these towers have been um, known in the past for uh, the emission of radio uh, frequency um, uh, and also some um, other environmental hazards, hazards uh, as the um, gigahertz increases um, in, um, in range. So the, the cell phone radiation uh, tower um, emissions have been studied quite heavily. So I guess as this goes out for consultation, it might be worthwhile for constituents to understand uh, the uh, radio frequency fields and how they impact uh, individuals and health concerns that are aligning with that. Um, but I guess I, it's a, a part of the community consultation that we reach out and see um, what people think. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Maloney. Any other, Councillor Grisbeck. Um, uh I guess this is out for community consultation, but I have some um, I have some reservations um, about the logistics. So there's a current pole which has non-standard lighting on it, and this is a proposal to put a bigger pole with uh, AFL standard lighting to the pole, um, and I get the need for those particular lights because the oval will be used by. Um, you know, the Geelong Falcons, but I'm worried that it's going to look absolutely odd being one pole out of, I'm assuming, four around a, an oval that is going to have one big light and three standard lights that are non-AFL standard. So um, I, I, I'm going to not, um, I'm going to not support this motion tonight because I think we, we actually haven't that's actually going to put council at risk around um, the need then to provide the f other three light towers with AFL standard lighting. And that's not a standard item uh, that we have at the city in terms of lux. So um, I'm not going to support this to go out because I just don't think it's ready. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Grisbeck. Councillor Nelson. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. I think Councillor Grib Grisbeck's reading my notes, but um, I will support this. <laughs> Um, report, but um, asking the community consultation um, to say that Telstra need to fund all the lights 
not just the one light. Um, it's pretty ridiculous um, to have just one light and then the other three don't work um, because then no one will ever have night games there. Um, but 30 metres, that's, that's 100 feet. Um, that's going to be seen from the moon, so it's going to be huge. But people want telephone reception, so that's just the way it is, I guess. But um, please have your say, um, heightened residents and people that use, use that area, um, and ask for more lights because council... Um, as Councillor Grisbeck said, um, it's not something that we can afford to do. So if Telstra is going to do that, let's, let's get them to foot the bill. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Nelson. Any other councillor comment on this? Otherwise, back to Councillor Harwood. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, the conversation has drifted a little to, uh, to the actual lights themselves, but um, the, the bottom line is um, there won't be night football played at, um, at Height and Reserve. The, the facilities there purely are not up to standard um, for the teams to, uh, to play down there. And it is a, a bugbear of uh, uh, Tommy Lonigan who looks after the Falcons down there and he's been working very hard with, um, with council and, and with governments about uh, uh, basically a new location where the AFL, with it, sorry, where the, um, the Falcons can locate uh, men and uh, boys and girls as such, um, can locate with a proper facility with proper lighting. Unfortunately, Height and Reserve is, is not the location. But um, So what they'll have is, is, is extra lighting for training, in all honesty, at this stage. So, But the, but the sentiment's good. I mean, if we're going to have a, a large corporation come and uh, put lights in a facility, um, why, why shouldn't we ask to have it maximised and have, uh, have greater capacity? Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Uh, put this matter to the vote. All those in favour? Against? That is carried. 10 is tender 230016, annual supply of bituminous spray sealing works. Move, Councillor Aiken, and seconded, Councillor Maloney. Councillor Aiken. Um, look, very quickly, this is actually just a standard tender process. It's actually so close to the delegation that um, the CEO has, but it was felt it was important to bring it back to the council because there was actually only one tenderer. Um, so it actually is for bituminous um, spray sealing, which essentially is um, we can actually spray on the top of our gravel road and actually put a bit of bitumen on the top of it and we can seal existing roads that actually have potholes and other things associated as well too. <coughs> it's actually a very small amount, um, $2 million, when you actually look at our total um, roads and um, infrastructure maintenance budget, but it is important that we, um, we do have this capacity and you may actually find Councillor Aiken may come back um, in the budget process to ask for more money for these types of works because the city services team is struggling, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Maloney. Uh, thank you so much, Mayor Murray. I commend that and also I agree, we need a bit more cash in that uh, area to splash, but um, the contract's worth uh, more than 1.96 million, so it's, I guess it's good for our, our transparency that we are bringing this to council. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, uh, Councillor Grisby? <coughs> uh, on the office that I'm not, speaking on every matter just as a matter of point, but I think this one is particularly interesting that um, it's Transport for Victoria. So this is the state government that has pitched for an open tender process through mm. to, the, to the local government, um, and they're supplying the works through to us. So um, whilst the procurement is sound, and I think this, this recommendation will go through, one of the things that I'm a bit nervous about is the risk mitigation here that given the state of Victorian's roads right at this very moment, that will they be able to uh, continue this contract into the next six months, uh, the next 12 months even, because the, the um, demand on their services uh, might become, uh, will become uh, more frequent, um, given that they are a state government entity that has pitched for this particular work. So I'm just probably flagging that the risk here might be that, that we actually um, won't be able to use these services because they'll be used uh, in other parts of the state. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Grisbeck. Any other councillor? Otherwise, back to you, Councillor Aiken. Nothing further to add. Put it to the vote. All those in favour? Against? That is carried. Item number 11, the Transformation Program 2.0 Progress Report to June 2022. Uh, move Councillor Harwood and seconded Councillor Sullivan. Councillor Harwood. Uh, Mr Mayor, uh, this is a report to note, but um, a couple of quick things. I mean, 
we now, well, the program is focusing on the critical projects as, as listed, um, and it's been a, uh, well, it's been up to six years now in, in process of this via the Commission of Inquiry into Council of um, some of the changes that uh, were recommended uh, via the community uh, group. Um, it's worth noting, though, I think um, uh, the transformation program is basically um, an assessment by council on council in many aspects. So, um, and th there's no doubt there's been significant change um, in recent years, which has been for the better. Um, but I do note, and I, I say this with absolute respect, um, particularly around the, um, uh, the advocacy and stakeholder management focus areas, uh, which are now substantially complete, I think this, this comment will come out more of recent times of uh, a community engagement and how we're going about it. And um, I think there's a, the, the time has come for us to sit back and look at some of those processes we go through. Um, that's not to say we don't have them, the majority of them right or correct. In, in actual fact, there are certainly times where you'll never ever please the community on different, um, different things that council deal with. But just in recent times, we've been um, we've been probably taking a bit of heat mm. um, for, for good and bad reason. Um, sometimes it's the nature of beast, the nature, nature of the beast of, of council having to deal with the community on sensitive issues where there's winners and losers, where there's people who um, who are grieved by um, changes in their particular environment and neighbourhood. So, and they're all, always going to be with us, and it goes with the territory. But I'm just um, just making a comment about how we might look in the future of our current practices and what they might look like in the in the future of um, uh, what changes we might consider. Um, and that may be a discussion for the council laws and the council officers to have uh, around the table and say, look, how are we going? What's working? What's not working? And uh, clearly there could be some improvements there. But I'll just make those comments. Just, um, it's not a criticism, it's just an observation. And I think that's <coughs> one area that we could um, perhaps all, all uh, improve our, uh, I guess, our communication back to the community itself. And hopefully they can understand uh, the, the processes, processes that we do go through and the uh, intensity that we do give um, community issues. Um, that'll do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Councillor Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I endorse the words of Councillor Howard. Uh, it's actually quite good to have this uh, report on the same night as the annual report because um, they are great documents for all those having a, who want to see, you know, what's going on inside this organisation within their, their community. And I'm sure the roughly 20 people watching online right now are such dedicated individuals. No other geese at it as well. Um, but it's a good chance of seeing you know, what's on track, what's not, um, what we are doing and what we're putting more efforts into. Um, often as well we get a lot of people talking about transparency in council. And this is a key document that, that so a lot of people aren't aware of and that we are putting uh, everything out there. Uh, so people can have a look at what's going on. So we are being transparent. We are showing the community what we're getting up to, what we're doing right, and what we're aiming to do better. Um, so I encourage everybody to have a look through this. And it's a great document. And I'm happy to second the motion. Thank you, Councillor Sullivan. Councillor Grisby. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. One of the things that you'll see on this report, and, and it's highlighted because it's in red, is the digital modernisation project. And I think um, what you can be sure of uh, as a community is that council laws and, and senior councillor uh, staff are looking at this um, with, with the minute of detail. So um, we, will, we will have some more to say on that in the, in the future, but it is showing red, which means that there is an issue there um, and, and we are working through that process right now. Um, we all get a little nervous when we talk about digital modernisations, IT projects within government, but um, I'm pleased to say that we've got the right people on it now to make sure that we get this right into the future. Um, and it's obviously well documented and, and all the way through the Audit and Risk Committee as well. So um, it is being looked after just to give the community some comfort. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Grisby. Councillor Aiken. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Look, the, the, this is actually really good for the council group and also the broader community because we're actually being transparent about um, a significant change process, which is the transformational process. What this report is actually shining sunlight on is that we're not meeting our original projected targets. And um, as a consequence, it will generate questions, and it should. But as Councillor Gresbeck has highlighted, the council group over the last couple of months has led quite significant review and investigation into 
why we're not meeting those particular targets. And um, as a consequence, it is good that we're being transparent with our community now to actually show this report and actually say, look, we, we, we aren't meeting what we said we were going to do, but what we are confident we're going, what we are going to do is actually make sure that we reach the outcomes and objectives that we originally set in terms of the transformation project that came from the Commission of Review and the original <coughs> sacking of, um, of the Council back in 2000 and was it 15, Bruce, or 13, sorry? Yeah. 16, yeah. And as 16, a consequence, yeah. um, it is, it is good that this council is actually understanding that we do have to share this information with the community because it will make better decision-making processes and it will actually show the transparency um, that this council demands and expects of its responsibilities. Yeah. Uh, any other councillor? Otherwise, back to you, Councillor Howard. Uh, nothing further to add. Thank you. Just to the vote. All those in favour? Against? That is carried. Item number 12 is the appointment of an independent member to the Audit and Risk Committee. Moved uh, Councillor Grisbeck and seconded Councillor Aiken. Councillor Grisbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. This is an important part of our responsibility is to appoint the independent member to the Audit and Risk Committee. Uh, and I'm pleased that this report recommends the reappointment of Lisa Tripodi uh, to our uh, Audit and Risk Committee for a third and final term of three years. Um, the Audit and Risk Committee uh, does uh, look after the Council in terms of uh, many issues, financial governance, risk management, audit and compliance matters. Um, and uh, Lisa's, the current independent member, is also the chair of the Audit Committee at the moment as well. Um, uh, Lisa has provided um, you know, great support to the committee and great support to the council, along with the other independent members as well. Um, just during this process, I'd like to uh, also publicly acknowledge uh, the work of uh, Jeff Harry, who was our former member on the Audit and Risk Committee, and um, say thank you to Jeff for his hard work. Um, he was also brought in on as the independent member post-administration, uh, if I'm recalling correctly, and so it was a really uh, opp opportune time for uh, the Audit and Risk Committee to make uh, its its uh, changes that were required to when uh, councillors were brought back into the city after that that uh, short period of time. And Jeff provided um, many a, a sounding board to me during my time when he was the chair, and Lisa has also done the same, I'm sure, to many of us, uh, both councillors and officers, uh, during her time as chair. So I'd like to welcome um, and congratulate, uh, if this is successful, Lisa, back to the Audit and Risk Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gisbeck. Uh, Councillor Aiken. Um, to echo the words of Councillor Grisbeck, um, it's actually very hard to respond to somebody when they speak so well on the motion, so congratulations, Councillor Grisbeck. Um, all I wish to say is that the Audit and Risk Committee is actually one of the most important um, governance mechanisms we have as councillors. It actually protects us as the council group. It actually reports to us as the council group. And it actually ensures that we are having an independent layers over the administration and the organisation. And um, the Audit and Risk Committee um, does ha um, have that responsibility. And they have fulfilled it very well over the last five years, as Councillor um, Gresbeck has referred to. And um, it is important that um, we continue continuity and we also um, provide the support and resources to make sure that they can provide this safeguard and safety valve that the audit and risk does for our responsibilities as councillors. Thank you. Any other councillor? Otherwise, uh, Councillor Grisbeck. Nothing further, Mr Mayor. The vote, all those in favour? Against? That is carried. Section three, the record record of informal meetings of councillors. Uh, can I please have a mover and a seconder for the record of informal meetings of councillors? Moved Councillor Sullivan, seconded Councillor Mason. All those in favour? Against, that is carried. Section four is planning delegations. Can I please have a mover and a seconder for the planning delegations? Moved Councillor Harwood, seconded Councillor Grisbeck. Uh, all those in favour? Against, that is carried. Uh, section 5 is confidential, uh, the Audit and Risk Committee summary report. Can I please have a mover and a seconder to consider this matter in confidential session? Moved Councillor Grisbeck, seconded Councillor Aiken. All those in favour? It's carried. 
We are now to consider the remaining agenda item in our confidential section of the meeting. Uh, can I please add a mover and a second to close the meeting to the public so we consider this confidential agenda item. Moved, Councillor Asher. Seconded, Councillor Sullivan. All those in favour? Against, that is carried. Uh, I would like to thank both our virtual and in-person gallery members for their participation.